Mm -hmm. oh, I could have left the meeting there. Oh, I should. All right, thank you all for coming. Can you hear me okay? Everyone? We'll get started. I'm going to call this meeting to order. We have a bunch of us online, so it looks like everyone's here. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Is there a second? I second. Any discussion? I move this to a vote. We'll do a roll call vote, please. Marianne Duncan Cole? Aye. Megan Dugan? Aye. Olga Hodges? Now we sort of can hear you, didn't hear your vote. Try one more time, please. Can you type your vote in chat, please, Olga? You're cutting out. You're cutting out. Let us know when you have it so she can move on. Olga, if you can hear us, um, type your vote in chat and we're going to continue on. And all the rest of the Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Can you hear me okay now? <laughs> okay. Um, I could hear you when you said, can you hear me now? I could not hear a vote. <laughs> vote is 
yes and i typed in the chat thank you thank you we heard that okay uh, marie coffee Marie, are you there? If you can hear us, Marie, please type your vote into the chat. Great. Does Marie say anything? Okay. <laughs> Got it. We can, if you don't mind, we can keep moving and read the chat when we're finished. Okay, uh, Vikram Katwani. Yes. Penny Love Hensley. Aye. And Christy Morgan. Aye. Based on the majority, <laughs> this passes. All right, I don't have any comments today, so we'll just um, go through public comment guidelines. Christy? Yes. May I make a request to make one announcement? Sure. Go for it. Um, I just would like to introduce Rush Schaefer to you. Um, she is our uh, White Salmon Valley branch manager, and she has agreed to step in as a temporary public services director. So you'll be seeing Ruth at all of our board meetings for a while. Um, so we'll run down the list of, of guidelines. Please don't play videos or audio for us. We want to hear your comment. Please don't applaud between comments. Keep your comments directed toward the board, not to, the, not to each other. Please be respectful of others' comments, even if you disagree with them. Talking and laughing and those sorts of behaviors, just don't do them. Um, this is your time to have us hear your comments. We won't be answering questions. And we will keep a timer on the board for two minutes. There's also a 30 second um, sign to give you a heads up when you're reaching the end of your time. And that's all I have. Um, so Amelia is gonna call names. She'll only do two at a time. So we aren't making people stand for so long. We'll have one speaker and then one waiting. Please say your name when you come up to comment. And actually I'm gonna start with our online. Um, speakers. So I'm going to start with Jude Jacobs. Hello, hello. Hi, my name is Jude, and um, I'm here today to talk about a little bit about equality and provide a little bit of education around some things that we seem to have a difference of opinion on as far as uh, some of the other commenters from last time. One thing that I wanted to mention is just the difference between gender identity and gender per performance or gender expression. So gender identity is that felt sense of who you are on the inside. Um, and for most folks, it stabilizes around three years old, somewhere between three to five, depending on what you look at in the research. Gender performance, on the other hand, or gender expression is kind of what we do with that information. And it can be a lot of different things. For example, for a lot of women, they wear makeup or maybe they paint their nails or wear dresses. Um, and it doesn't, how we perform gender doesn't change our gender identity. Um, gender identity is something that can be a great source of euphoria and pride. And it can be something that causes a lot of stress depending on how folks treat it. We know that exposure to others with a gender identity, everybody has a gender identity, right? So exposure to others does not is not contagious because if it were, and we know that you know, 95 plus percent of the population is cis, then everyone was, would be cis, right? Our goal is not to turn any cis kids trans, it's to keep the trans kids alive. And one way that we can do that is providing representation and modeling acceptance. And when it comes to what we're modeling for kids, we're literally modeling that it's okay to be you, it's okay to dress up, it's okay to have fun. And those are things that are important qualities for our community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emily Gandy. 
Hi there. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me speak today. Uh, today, I just wanted to give y'all a brief history of left-handedness and how it intersects with what we're talking about right now. When we think about the history of left-handedness, um, being left-handed up until about 1910, 1920 was seen as the mark of the devil. So kids were subsequently told by all authority figures in their life that it is wrong and that it is bad and that you should not do it. When we now know that left-handedness is perfectly innate, being left-handed is not, in fact, uh, the mark of demonic possession or something is wrong with you for being left-handed, right? And so in school, kids were essentially beaten, the left-handedness was beaten out of them, yeah? And so after, uh, I believe it was 1910, uh, we finally realized that being left-handed is not the mark of the devil and subsequent kids were allowed to be who they are and we saw rates of left-handedness spike in our country until it plateaued to about 12 percent which is where it sits to this day how does this relate to what we're talking about here it relates because up until even the 1980s or 1990s up, I mean, up until uh, like 1972, homosexuality was a diagnostic or a diagnosis in our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. What we're seeing right now, because accessibility has increased and acceptance has increased for gender nonconforming or um, non-heteronormative individuals being more accepted within our communities and in our country, we're obviously seeing rates increase because kids are no longer being told that it's wrong or that it's bad. It is not pathology, it is accessibility. If we let kids be kids, we're gonna see increasing rates and sexuality and gender identity is not pathology, you can't catch it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julia Don Siever. Oh, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, hi, Don Siever. Um, I there was a couple things last at the last meet that I wanted to clear up. Uh, one was that being transgender is as common as having red hair. Activists are constantly trying to conflate intersex with gender dysphoria. That's absolutely false. It comes from an article that classifies all differences in sexual disorders or DSDs as intersex, which are people with ambiguous genitalia. In fact, 88% of the people classified as intersex in that article actually just lack an enzyme involved in producing adrenal steroid hormones, and they have no sexual ambiguity at all. Something else activists don't want to talk about is that intersex and other DSD conditions are visible and testable. There is physical proof, whereas gender identity is based on a feeling and the fact that the vast majority of kids will change their minds before adulthood only further confirms that. The other claim was that the suicide rate for trans people is higher because they aren't accepted. There's absolutely no evidence linking a higher risk of suicide uh, to an unaffirmed gender identity. As stated before, the vast majority of those with gender dysphoria have comorbid disorders like depression and anxiety. Further, that long-term study that we've talked about where those who transitioned had a suicide rate uh, 19 times higher than the general population was conducted in Sweden. Now, Sweden started allowing individuals to change their sex status on legal documents in 1972. So it's quite accepting there. This is a lie that the industry uses to scare parents into, into compliance. And it's irresponsible and dangerous as it could become a self-fulfilling prophecy as noted in a peer reviewed paper. Someone also said at the last meeting that the library has a duty to serve all. That implies anyone and everyone should be able to read and interact with kids, which would assume that would include stripper story hour or something like that. Um, it strains credibility that no judgment whatsoever should be used when pl planning books and programming for children. The library has no obligation to ensure that drag queens can interact with children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Gardner. Yes. Way over there. Um, and then after that, we'll be Quill Onstead. Is on? <laughs> Good evening. My name is Catherine Gardner, pronoun she, her, and I'm a resident of Vancouver. There is absolutely nothing wrong with a parent deciding a certain book is not right for their child. There is a colossal problem with a parent deciding that, therefore, no child should be allowed to read that book. Jody Pickled. Censorship is a sin, especially in the hollowed confines of the public library. 
especially in this country where freedoms regarding speech, media, faith are sacred. There's a very loud minority trying to inflict their moral views upon the larger population. They lazily slap vilifying labels on any item they don't agree with. They try and impose control as a reaction to their own fear, fear of evils and harms they can't actually prove. Along with the excellent technology resources I mentioned last month, kudos to the Fort Vancouver Regional Library for stocking dictionaries. These quaint throwback tomes include the definition of the word optional, quote, available, available to be chosen, but not obligatory. As with Dre Queen Story Hours, books contained within this and libraries around the country are optional for you to check out. If a book's only crime is that it offends your sensibilities, good news, you have the option not to utilize it. You have the option to encourage your family to avoid it. Heck, you even have the option to yell at the top of your lungs that others should not access it, but you are not allowed to eliminate the option for them to do so if they choose. As board members, you have promised to be prepared to support the efforts of library staff in resisting censorship. The talk of relabeling, recategorizing, and limiting access to books you disagree with, with is a first step to censorship. As board members, you have also agreed to avoid situations in which personal interests might be served at the expense of library users or the institution, and to disqualify yourself immediately whenever the appearance of a conflict of interest exists. Please keep your promises in mind and keep the library free and open to all people and all ideas, even the ones you disagree with. Thank you. After Quill, it will be Phil Cronenbush. Hi, my name is Quill Onstead and my pronouns are they, them. I'm here to speak in support of Dry Queen Story Hour as a genderqueer member of the community. Opponents of Drag Queen Story Hour say gender identity is something children should not learn about. It's inappropriate. Children already learn about gender identity. They see it every day, how their families behave, the toys they play with, the movies they watch. Funnily enough, it's only considered inappropriate when the gender identities involved are queer outside the social quote unquote norm. But the world is a big place. Dry Queen Story Hour is a way for kids to start thinking about how people can show up in the world in different ways and how that's not a bad or scary thing. People who treat drag lights innately perverse do so because they, deep down, believe gender non-conforming people are perverse. Dry Queen Story Hour is a vital program that teaches kids about gender identity in an age-appropriate manner. Parents who do not approve of Dry Queen Story Hour do not have to bring their children to Dry Queen Story Hour programs. Please allow the staff of FERL Libraries to present Drag Queen Story Hour and let the district live up to the ideals espoused in FERL's Libraries Equity Statement. Thank you for your service to the community. After Phil, Ash, I'm gonna get your last name wrong, Debus. Good evening. Thank you, board, free time. I'm Phil Cronrush from Orchards. I believe it is the best interest of the board to maintain a policy of neutrality, not equity. FERL's strategic plan is advocacy, but the library should remain neutral in social matters. This policy sets a collision course between the public and the people who run the library that has been amply shown by the continued outpouring of community engagement with the library board at every location the board met at in the last four years. The basic mission statement of the, of the library equity is inappropriate and a misguided principle of the Fort Vancouver Regional Library. Our job is to do our best to get library materials and the programs that were approved by the board to the community members who are served by FERL. What has happened in the past is that entities within the library have chosen to put their agendas forth, equity, diversity, inclusion, gender identity. All we can do is give each person the right to view the materials as he so chooses. Equity is not the mission, neutrality is. The librarians, the librarians should, the librarians should not use in any way the resources of the library to promote their own personal social views. Advocate, advocacy for marginalized communities, as stated in the strategic plan, is not neutral. The promotion of social <clears throat> views like equity is apparent to the public in the organization of book displays and in the organization of events like Drag Queen Story Hour. I'd like to ask you to make the policy of the library to remain neutral in politics, social events, social calendars, social interactions, and social needs. Uh, we would like to keep this library safe for children under the age of 18, but maintain the neutral spaces for adults. I'm asking the board to please stop the advocacy and put the library on a course of neutrality. Thank you very much. Right, after Ash, we have Tiffany. 
I'm not going to get this last name right either. Yes. Heinz? Hi, my name is Ash. My pronouns are they and them. I've lived in Southwest Washington for most of my 31 years, and thank you for hearing us today. Um, the American Library Association has reported an over 38% rise in challenges to information in libraries with over 2,500 individual titles in 2022. So this may be a little outdated, 2023, with 90% of all challenged books being part of attempts to ban multiple titles. The majority of these titles are by, for, and about queer people and people of color. These challenges and bans are aimed at our public libraries as well as our public schools and their forms of censorship and attempts to limit our freedoms. I'm here in support of diverse programming in public libraries. I'm here in support of the expertise of our librarians and the care in which they curate and catalog FBRL's collections. Um, I'm also here to express gratitude for the space that has been available um, for children and for other members of the community who feel like they may not be accepted otherwise. Um, it was not safe for me to be trans or queer as a kid in my hometown, in my family, and the library provided a safe space for me. So thank you for your time. All right, Tiffany. Hello, board. My name is Tiffany. I'm from Vancouver, Washington, and I'm here tonight to oppose Drag Queen Story Hour at this library. I've attended four of these meetings thus far and have yet to hear from drag queens why they support this privilege to read to children. Like I've shared before, the drag queen community is merely a pawn for a political gain. The masterminds behind all this have no interest in the LGBTQ community. This is about community control and the sexualization of children, and they will use anyone to get this accomplished. I'm not for banning any community from attending libraries or being in the community, period. All persons have a choice and a right to live peacefully in their city and town. This is about the innocent lives of all children in our community to be free from this sexualization and indoctrination. This is about children who have a right to attend a safe environment where they are not being pushed onto sexual conduct to which they do not have the mature mindset to comprehend. Please board, stop Drag Queen Story Hour. Thank you board for hearing all sides of this issue. That concludes a list of people who have signed up. We have a lot of time left. Is there anyone who would like to make a comment that did not sign up? Thank you. If you polled kids today in our library district from age 15 to 18 and asked them if BLM, Antifa, and the Trans Resistance Network were examples of organizations or groups fighting for social justice, most would reply yes. We all remember watching nightly on our news for six months in 2020 of Antifa smashing windows, breaking and entering, looting, committing arson of businesses, burning cars, beating individuals, and even committing murder. That's Antifa, one of these fringe social justice groups. Then a month ago, just hours after a deadly shooting and murder of six people, three of them children at a Tennessee Christian school by a self-identifying transgender individual, simply because those killed in cold blood had a different belief system, the Trans Resistance Network publicly stated that the transgender individual, quote, had no other effective way to be seen than to lash out by taking the life of others. Also, they quote, life for transgender people is very difficult, and quote, hate has consequences. Again, the Trans Resistance Network is widely considered a social justice group and is advocating for murder. The ALA wrote equity policy number nine back in 2018, prior to the aforementioned revelations. Social justice is now being justified by some of these social justice groups as reason for committing murder. Do you really wanna put our current state of social justice and what it has evolved into recently into a policy as what you want to advance in our libraries? Equity policy number nine is outdated and dangerous 
Given these current examples of social justice by some of these social justice groups, the current equity policies one through eight are more than sufficient. Please carefully consider what you advocate for. Thank you. Would anyone else like to make comments? Thank you all. Thank you for, for your comments. Um, we are going to go to an executive session. The Fort Vancouver Regional Library District Board of Trustees will now meet in executive session to discuss personnel and, sorry, I can't read, and publicly bid contracts as allowed by RCW 423110. The Board of Trustees will be in executive session until, how long do you think? It's like 20 minutes, so 45. And we'll be in executive session until 6.45 p.m. The Board of Trustees is not expected to take further action following this executive session. Thank you. You can stay in this you, room. Yeah, we'll be leaving. So you guys can stay here. Thank you.
Yeah. Okay. Great. I see their names. Thank you. All right. I'm going to call this regular meeting back to order. We met for uh, 20 minutes on personnel and publicly bid contracts, and no action was taken. We'll move on to reports next. First up, we have. Um, first is, did you have something you want to? Oh, it was after that. Yeah, that's okay. I didn't catch it either. Elizabeth, is Duncan Brown online yet? Oh, okay. Um, let's go ahead and start with. Um, go ahead with reports then, you think? Okay, so we're going to start with Duncan Brown for the first report. Great. Uh, good evening. Can uh, can folks hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I'm Duncan Brown. I'm uh, with a firm called PFM Financial Advisors, LLC. Uh, we are the independent financial advisor to the library district um, and have been for uh, several years. Um, and Amelia invited me on this evening um, to give a brief uh, update to some of the topics that I covered almost a year ago with the board. Um, including a, a, just a few minutes on the municipal bond market and a discussion of how municipal debt works for library districts in Washington state. Um, I will also spend a few minutes talking about tax increment financing and tax increment areas, uh, which is um, new uh, to Washington um, and what that, what that means or could mean for the district going forward. Um, and if there are questions along the way, happy to um, happy to answer them um, or um, or address them at, at the end. And I'll I'll try to be brief here. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Yes, I I just said all these things, but I will start with market uh, two topics we covered uh, last year, and then also uh, move to tax increment financing. Um, so next next slide. And then next slide, because I put too many uh, dividers in here. Um, so this this slide shows uh, yield curves, uh, which uh, reflect the cost of borrowing for different terms from one to 30 years. And there are four different yield curves reflected here. The blue uh, are US treasuries, US treasury rates. And the red, um, that is the Bloomberg um, municipal bond index. So that's sort of a proxy for what highly rated municipal governments can borrow when they issue debt on a tax exempt basis. The solid lines are uh, where interest rates are currently or as of last Friday, and the dashed lines are where they were about a year ago. And you can see that um, on the longer end of the yield curve, so for longer, uh, for bonds with longer terms, interest rates for, for uh, uh, for local governments are more or less where they were about a year ago, notwithstanding sort of all we've, we've read about um, in terms of interest rate volatility, borrowing rates remain pretty much unchanged if you're a local government, um, at least on that, you know, for long-term debt. Uh, the short end of the yield curve is a different story. And particularly for treasuries, um, short-term treasury rates are very high. And in fact, the yield curve is inverted. So short-term treasuries, one-month treasuries, in fact, which aren't even shown here, but but those are, are have yield have interest rates yields higher than two or three-month treasuries because investors are concerned about the risk of default um, uh, if a, a resolution to the debt ceiling um, standoff is not reached, and and so that's why concern about the debt ceiling is the number one reason why um, short-term interest rates are so high. Um, but again, for longer term borrowing rates for local governments, 
it's more or less business as usual, or at least business as of May 2022. Uh, so I'll go to the next slide. And there's a lot going on here, um, but in, in sum, this is again taken from Bloomberg, um, a, a collection of where market participants, where interest rates have been, certain certain benchmark rates. I won't go through all of them here. Certain rates have been, and then where uh, market participants think that they will go over the next two years. Um, and as you can see here, uh, the the market consensus is that we're kind of at the peak, and that rates will um, sort of gradually decline in the next year or two. Um, I, this, of course, is, is just a projection. I've seen I've seen uh, charts that look like this many times before, and they're not always correct, but this is what the market um, currently expects. So, so good news for, for folks who, who may be, or, or potential good news, I should say, for anyone who's possibly um, looking to borrow money um, in the next year or two. If there are no questions on the bond market, um, I'll dive into a kind of a refresher on how bonds work for library districts specifically. And again, some of this may look pretty familiar um, as we covered it last May as well. Um, so I, I've already talked a little bit about municipal bonds. Um, what are bonds? Essentially, a bond is a loan. Um, instead of one lender, you have multiple investors, each with each of which has, has lent a small amount of money to the borrower. Um, and in, in Washington state, library districts can issue two types of debt, two types of bonds, uh, what we call limited tax general obligation bonds, which require um, authorization by the board of trustees, but do not require a vote um, of, uh, of, uh, of voters in the district. And unlimited tax general obligation bonds or UTGO bonds, which do require like similar to, to school district bonds, which we see uh, fairly often, those do require a supermajority, 60% voter approval. Um, limited tax general obligation bonds um, have to be paid for uh, debt service, principal and interest on those bonds has to be paid from um, current resources. So there is, no, um, there is no new tax or anything like that that comes with uh, attached to those bonds. Unlimited tax general obligation bonds come with a new excess or unlimited property tax um, that it can be only only can be used to pay debt service on those bonds. Again, this is this is what school districts do um, pretty often. Um, and uh, the, the cost the cost of capital, the the, the interest rates on, on these two are pretty similar. But from an investor standpoint, the UTGO is probably a um, slightly more safe investment just because it does come with that additional tax stream um, uh, specific to the bond issue. So next slide, please. Um, for library districts, excuse me, library districts, uh, general obligation debt is, is limited by state statute. Um, I won't dive into the specifics, um, largely because for a district with the assessed value um, like the Fort Vancouver Regional Library District has, they're not meaningful. They are just incredibly massive amounts of debt <laughs> that um, will never, um, I don't have the figures here, but the last time I checked, it was it was an eye-popping number. So, so they're not a really a meaningful check on the district's ability to issue debt. Um, the more meaningful district, the, excuse me, the more meaningful limitation for, for limited tax general obligation bonds, um, which, which um, again, do not require uh, voter approval is just the ability to actually pay principal and interest and kind of commit resources um, to those payments year in and year out. Uh, the, the limiting factor on unlimited tax debt, of course, is um, sort of what's uh, what what the electorate um, uh, will approve. Uh, but back to limited tax general obligation bonds. If, if we scroll down just a little, um, we did take a look at um, some, some estimates for. Uh, just using sort of a hypothetical $300,000 annual payment, um, similar to kind of looking at a home mortgage, what can I afford if my, uh, my income is X? If, if, uh, 
the income stream or the revenue stream for debt service here is 300,000 annually. That translates to net proceeds for capital purposes of between 2.3 and $3.7 million, depending on the term of the, of the debt. Um, and I, sh I should mention, these numbers are pretty similar to what they were last year um, when, we, when we updated these, uh, this analysis for the board. Um, I think the 20 year figures is down about $200,000 and the other two are down a little less. Um, so, so slightly lower than, um, than the estimates last year, but, but pretty close. Um, and I should note that the reason we, we go out to 20 years is because library districts by statute are limited, uh, cannot issue debt longer than, or cannot issue li limit tax general obligation debt longer than 20 years. So that's a, that's a hard stop. Uh, next slide. And then um, within those two types of bonds that can be sold, uh, the two sort of security uh, pledges, there are a variety of ways of actually mechanically issuing that debt. Uh, the most common is a public bond offering um, in which the issuer, um, again, hypothetically here, that the district um, would engage an underwriter uh, who would then uh, distribute those bonds to a variety of different investors. Uh, this tends to be a, a most cost-effective for larger bond issues. Um, it's, it's fairly involved in terms of process. Um, there are also, uh, it, it, it's also become more common in the last decade or so to sell bonds directly to commercial banks. Um, and commercial banks in some cases have folks who, who deal just with, with purchasing debt directly from local governments. Bank credit is kind of a challenge right now because um, uh, in the wake of the various bank failures that we've been uh, reading about, um, some banks are uh, tightening their belts quite a bit. Um, and then for, for Washington local governments, the state local program is also very popular. Um, it tends to be a little less flexible. It's, it's, it's you know, has some um, pretty specific rules established by state treasurer's office, um, but it requires um, very little in terms of uh, 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 upfront costs and uh, time commitment by the uh, by the participant by the borrower. So that's sort of a, a just a brief flyby of how bonds work for library districts. If there are no questions, I'll talk a bit about tax increment financing, uh, which is sort of an, a, a new concept in Washington State. Duncan, this is Amelia. I thank you for that. I, you know, we've it's been a year, and I was anticipating a larger increase in interest rates. Um, so that's a positive sign. Um, and the board had requested, since we have so many new members, an opportunity yeah. to, uh, you know, have a little more uh, understanding of possible um, finance uh, opportunities for the district. Um, oh, Marianne, go ahead. I'm curious uh, when it's Port Vancouver Regional Library how we involve the foundation at all, or do we have a con um, some sort of contract? Is there any way we are involve involving the foundation? That would be separate from financing. Okay. So Duncan, um, we they know uh, some about TIFs. I think this is an opportunity to um, kind of give us your perspective. Uh, sure, and, and maybe before we dive in here, I just as a matter of full disclosure, and and I, I really I know I know we've talked about this in the past, but PFM does represent a few of the uh, sponsors of tax increment areas, including some within Clark County. Um, um, so, just for for context, uh, we do work with a few of the folks who are who who have or are planning on creating these, um, but I, I can talk a little bit about what they mean for the district. If we go to the next slide. Um, so just generally speaking, um, it sounds like some, some of the board members uh, uh, may be familiar with, with TIF and concept. Um, it's a, a financial tool that uh, is intended to kind of take, take future year assessed value growth, capture it, 
and use it to uh, finance public improvements that spur private development that lead to that assessed value growth. So it's um, it's uh, it's a way for a a particular local government to sort of identify a, an, an area or a zone or district, depending on the state, and say we're going to build, um, we're going to expand uh, street capacity or put in um, more parking or a new park or some water and sewer um, capacity improvements. Um, because if we don't, then this new development won't materialize and we'd like this new development to materialize so to promote economic development. And in order for us to do this, um, we need to take uh, the, in, the increment, we have to capture the incremental growth in assessed value um, and sort of redirect the property taxes associated with that growth um, in order to fund those developments that promoted that growth in the first place. So it's sort of this, this loop. Um, and it's actually, it's very common, uh, has been very common elsewhere in the country or in various parts of the country, including in, in Oregon, where it's been used for, for decades. Um, I think it's probably a little easier to understand visually, at least it is, it is for me. Um, and we have sort of an example on the next slide. And in essence, that, that gray or I guess kind of tan area on the bottom, this is you know, taking a hypothetical district. So you know, it could be a few parcels, it could be, um, uh, it could be larger than that. We're just using round numbers here. Um, that, that gray area, that, that tan area, that tan assessed value is kind of frozen at year one when the district is created or the area is created. And all of the, the property tax and jurisdictions um, that, that assess property taxes um, on, that, on that area continue to receive um, property tax revenues as if that assessed value is unchanged. So here, I think it's at a million dollars, again, just round numbers. So for the life of this tax increment areas, all of the overlapping districts kind of um, they, they receive the property tax revenue, at least for this, for this specific area, as if the assessed value remains flat. Now, of course, it's not going to remain flat. It will grow over time, um, maybe not in every year, but hopefully, um, hopefully over time, and particularly if there is a, a significant new development um, and, and new construction, which is the whole purpose of this um, concept. That blue piece, that incremental growth, that assessed value um, the, the property taxes that are imposed on that assessed value are essentially redirected rather than the jurisdictions that um, would otherwise receive them. They are redirected to the sponsor of the district, which is the one that's building the roads or the water and sewer improvements or the sidewalks or what have you. And, and so they get sort of the, all of the increase and they capture that increase and they can leverage that for, in order to finance those uh, those improvements, those upfront costs that lead to the new development in the first place. So this shows kind of a, a gradually sloping triangle. Um, I think it's, we've probably got a 3% growth factor or something like that. The, the hope is really that in the first few years that that increment incremental value jumps up significantly as new construction comes on the tax rolls. And um, so it doesn't look quite as quite as smooth as this. Um, but then after, at the, at the expiration of that, of that district or that area, when it's closed, all of that assessed value is returned to the overlapping districts. The, the tax increment area or, or district is, is dissolved and sort of life returns to normal, except everyone has a lot more assessed value um, uh, and, and the property tax revenue that goes with it. So we'll go to the next slide. Hey, Duncan, before you go off that slide, I have a question for you. This is yeah. Amelia. Um, I noticed that you have out at your 28. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I think we were trying to get a little too cute here. So it, so if you look at, at year th the, the arrow that says tax increment area created, that's at year three. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason that we had it out there is it, do, it does take some time for when, when a city or county or port um, which are the three types of entities that can create a, an, an area in Washington State. 
whenever they say go, or when they start sort of talking about it and preparing the study, it takes, um, it could take a few years actually before it, the area is actually um, redirecting re tax revenues. And so here, if we said that's year three, year 28 is a 25 year term um, for that area. Yeah, but I think that's something good to know is that it doesn't start right away. Uh, TIP is formed, and I think it's a year before yeah, the tax it, collection starts. It is it is an arduous process, um, and it involves the creation of a report. Uh, I won't go through the whole timeline, but the creation of a report that is submitted to the state treasurer's office. Uh, there are some required public briefings. Um, once, once an entity has, has gone through all of the, the hoops and made all the findings and ha held all the briefings and the governing body adopts resolution or ordinance creating the area, the area becomes effective the following June 1st. And then the tax increment, the, the revenue implications, the taxing implications take effect the following tax year. So if uh, a city or county or port district were to start talking about all this stuff today, they probably wouldn't make the June 1st deadline in, three, in two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so they would probably be looking at, at officially creating the area maybe by the June 1st, 2024 deadline and having it go into effect June 1st, 2020, or tax year, excuse me, tax year 2025. So that's an 18 month process. Um, um, I think Marianne has a question. Are there any communities in our um, district that have exercised the tax increment financing and already are on board? Or do you know of any that are thinking of that? Yeah, I, I, I do. And, and again, I, um, you know, we work, the, the two that we work with, um, the Port of Vancouver created a, a tax increment area, which um, is in effect, although I don't, I, it has been created, I, I think the, it needed a technical fix at the state led at the most recent legislative session. Um, I think it, the revenue implications won't occur until next year. That's uh, um, And then the city of Ridgefield is also um, looking at creating an area, but I think they are going to, they're, I think on that 24, 25 timeline that I kind of just described. And, and there may be others. Um, those are just the ones that I'm aware of. And again, I'm aware of them because I'm, we're working with them. Thank you. Um, so I, I mentioned sort of the history here, the fact that these can be created by cities, counties, and port districts. You know, the library district is sort of the, the bystander here. Um, the, the, the selling point of a tax increment area is that this development would not occur absent the public improvement. And so the jurisdictions that are affected by having this tax, this incremental tax revenue redirected are really no worse off um, because absent that, um, that redirected tax revenue, there would be no growth in assessed value or at least not of that magnitude. And hey, at year 2026, 20, when it comes back on the tax, on, when the area is, is um, winds down, you get this big bump, at least within that defined area. Um, that That is the premise of tax increment financing. Um, it's kind of impossible to prove because, you know, none of this exists in a vacuum and there's no sort of perfect control. Um, but that is, that is the selling point. Um, so Duncan, I have a question then. So in the past, prior to the TIF being created for Washington, how did cities uh, finance infrastructure such as this? I, well, it's, it's a great question. I mean, it, it really varied. Um, some of them would, um, some of them would sort of create a, almost a, a, a de facto you know, for a new shop, for a mall, for instance, they would sort of, um, if, if you were a, a, a city or county that were a new, uh, a new shopping development was going in or, or something with a lot of sales, ongoing sales tax activity, you might kind of redirect, you, you might sort of say, here is our 
projected incremental sales tax. And we're going to use that, um, that to, to, to finance um, these improvements. But that's, that's, that's just, you know, if it's, if I'm a city, that's my, the projections of my city's sales tax or my county's sales tax. It's not sort of taking it from um, ca or capturing it from all of the overlapping jurisdictions. Um, you know, there are a variety of other fees or um, variety of other fees or sort of ways to get creative with existing resources. Um, but there wasn't, I mean, there really wasn't anything like truly like tax, tax increment financing. There was, there was a program that the state ran about a decade or so ago that was sort of tended to kind of be like TIF light, but it really only functioned because the state provided some, some subsidies to, um, I think to the, the first 10 or 15 applicants. Um, So, so I, don't I, I have a couple more questions on that. One is that I think there's a constitutional challenge potentially here in that voters voted for library districts and fire districts um, for their taxes to go to those things. And now those taxes are being taken <laughs> and put to other purposes. And while I understand why and how you know this benefits the library district in the long run, in the short run, it could potentially be taking dollars that are intended to pay for services, let's say it's a residential area that's developed and the people living in that residential area will pay library taxes um, and whether or not there's a base rate there or not. Um, but then, then they're going to expect services. And I think this mm -hmm. is more true of fire departments probably than, than library districts, but um, because everybody expects the fire department to come when their house is on fire. You know, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, and I, you may not have the answer to this question, but how, you know, how does, how do we speak to those users who live in those areas whose taxes yeah. are going to pay for infrastructure for 20 years? Well, I, I mean, I guess I would, I have a couple of observations there. What one is that in most cases, there will still be, and, and again, I, I don't want to, I don't want to come across, I, I didn't write this legislation, right? Or, or a financial advisor sort of reacting to what the legislature creates. So I, I'm not trying to be sit here as a kind of a TIF advocate, or or or, or conversely, you know, trying to to um, uh, you know uh, drag it through the mud. Um, in in most cases, there will be some base assessed value on which you know that on, on which all of the overlapping districts. Will still continue to receive um, their regular levy. It's only the incremental growth on top of that that sort of is redirected. Uh, so it's not sort of going from it, it's not sort of a wholesale redirect. It's only the portions that um, the 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 new assessed value after that the growth in assessed value after the area is, is established which I mean to your to your point can be significant so it's you know if it's if we're talking about sort of empty land that then becomes a new housing development um, and for fire districts there are some requirements that um, it, it the the uh, tax the report that needs to be prepared has to specifically address how the creation of the area will impact fire services and um, and also propose mitigation plans um, if those services will be um, materially impacted. So fire districts do sort of have a special call out there. Library districts, unfortunately, do not. Um, as to the constitution, I mean, I, I'm not a constitutional lawyer. I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer at all. Um, I know that there were, you know, 40 years ago, there was there was TIF legislation that was struck down by the state Supreme Court because it did not, it, it captured state school property taxes, which um, you have special, um, uh, sort of the highest standing, uh, you know, education of um, K-12 education as special constitutional call outs. Um, and, and that's why this legislation specifically exempts the state school levy from that sharing. So, um, I guess we'll see. 
I, I, I don't know where that risk is going to go. And, and unfortunately, there's really not the library fire districts do get sort of a special acknowledgement um, of that risk that, that, that you just mentioned, um, but library districts do not. Thanks, Duncan. I appreciate letting me uh, or letting yeah put you on the spot there. <laughs> there are some guardrails around tax increment areas, and maybe if we scroll down, I can I can walk through a few of them. Um, they they can't be more than uh, they're limited as to size, twenty percent of the sponsor's AV or or two hundred million dollars. They're limited as to term. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, there are certain levies that are uh, excluded. Uh, I mentioned the state school levy, the ports and PUDs aren't um, uh, their regular levies and then all, all excess levies. And, and this would include things like, for instance, the Vancouver Library Capital Facility, uh, Capital Facilities area, the voted general obligation bonds uh, that that area issued, um, those are exempt from, uh, from the tax increment sort of redirect. Uh, but not uh, obviously the the district's regular levy, uh, and there is, you know, there there is quite a bit of outreach and project analysis required. Uh, but there really, there really isn't um, other than there really isn't much in the way of approvals other than the governing body of. Um, of the city, county, or or port district, uh, the state treasurer's office has a role in reviewing tax increment areas uh, and, and the project analysis, but they just provide feedback. They are not, um, they don't, they can't veto or or change the plan. Um, but I guess. As I met, as we talked about at the beginning, these plans take quite a bit of time to develop, um, and they usually, well, I shouldn't say usually, they they have been around long enough for anything to be usual. But um, I, I think it, from our experience, they do tend to change somewhat um, as they um, as as they get refined. Um, so I think there are. There are opportunities to, um, for at least for input, if not, uh, you know, there, there's no sort of formal requirement, but there there are certainly opportunities for input along the way, just because they take so long to get from from start to finish. And, and I guess maybe just getting back to, and, and it'll be interesting to see how this, how this develops as, as uh, entities continue to, you know, continue to create new, new areas or, or explore new areas. It, in our experience, and this, so this is just purely anecdotal, um, and it's very limited, obviously, because this legislation has only been around for, um, for about a, a little over a year. Um, but most of these, most of these areas are not that they are focused on commercial development. Um, not that they they have not been focused on sort of residential um, residential development to date. Um, there's nothing that prohibits that. I, I don't think in the statutes, but. Um, It's just not as big and sexy as a uh, new commercial development. And I, I think that's the end of my, my prepared slides. Um, oh, the appendix, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not planning on going into the detailed bond market update. Um, Thank you. That's just for- We do appreciate that. <laughs> Oh, Duncan, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share this presentation with the board so they have an opportunity to look at it at their leisure. Um, but I do appreciate your uh, taking the time to talk to us about it. I know it's a complex um, thing, and you know we are still trying to sort of figure out how much impact tips are going to have on us. So I appreciate that additional information. Um, 
primarily this is of interest to us, I think, for the future in terms of uh, funding uh, future projects. So um, I really appreciate the update. And unless there's any other questions. Um, we'll yeah, I, I have a question for you, Duncan. You may have, um, sorry, excuse me. You may have answered it pretty much with Amelia's question, but in terms of the city of Richfield, this is not a voter. They don't get a voice in this. And as Amelia said, they voted for their money going to the library to the fire department, but now it's it's changed. Is this a slam dunk for the council of Richfield to approve this? Is it a maybe? Is it this is really what's going to happen? It's a decision, and they're going forward, or is there a maybe in this? You know, I, I'm not sure I'm, well, I'm not sure I know, I, I know enough about the politics to really opine on that. And I'm not sure I, I, I'm, I, I would be comfortable um, sort of diving into that, just given our relationship with, with the city as well. Um, but in this case, I think I'm, I'm too ignorant to really offer an informed opinion as to um, the, the council's viewpoint here. I, 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 I you know, to, to, to the earlier first half of that question, you're, you're right, there is no vote, there is no um, formal step here for voter or for citizen. Um, there are briefings, there's sort of opportunities to engage, but there's no opportunity, there's no requirement that, that voters approve anything uh, in order for a, an area to be created. Okay, I just immediately sent us the information on what the city of Richfield is looking at improving and all of the changes and things they're going to do with this money and it was like, well, how fast the city of Richfield is growing as all the little communities are out here so it just made me think do they have a voice or do they not have a voice you know do we have a voice as a library building no we don't it sounds like so, okay that, that clarifies that as much as it can be I think Thank you, Duncan. Great. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, we'll keep moving on to um, Summer at Your Library with Kelsey Hudson. So switching gears completely. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, Kelsey is our youth yeah. outreach and program coordinator. And she's in charge of our summer reading program. Oh, there we go. So yes, um, I am Kelsey Edson, as Amelia said, and I summer at your library is kind of one of my big things every year. So I'm very excited to get to come and kind of share with you about this. As Amelia said, this will be wholly different from the last thing that we just did, um, as evidenced by the cartoons on the on the screen. So, uh -huh. um. So summer at your library each year, we have a series of goals that remain pretty similar from year to year, although we do adjust them a little bit to make sure they're really mindful and um, connected with our strategic goals and our mission, vision, and values. And so our goals that we were working with this year were to nurture learning, strengthen communities, and encourage library participation by encouraging patrons to explore, create, and share together. And our second goal was to support children who are most likely to need learning support over the summer but be the least likely to receive it. Push with confidence, as Elizabeth said. Um, so the basics of summer at your library, for those of you who aren't familiar, we run it from about June 15th to August 15th each year, and it's comprised of about three different pieces. So there's the challenge, which many of you probably think of and many of our patrons do. It's that kind of summer reading challenge that many people did when they were kiddos. And for us, our challenge for patrons is to read for 30 days, and to explore, learn, and create one new thing. However, we also have two additional pieces to our Summer at Your Library kind of overarching program. And the second one is, of course, the program. So we try to bring some educational and um, entertaining and hands-on programming, both into our libraries and online. And then we also have outreach, which is one of our key pieces to help reach that second goal. And that's bringing um, Summer at Your Library to children who really are unable to get to the library. So because this is the first time I'm getting a chance to meet a lot of you, I figured I might start with a little bit of 2022 by the numbers, give you a little bit of a preface. This is also a lot of what our staff uses to help kind of make plans for our 2023. We know these don't kind of tell everything, but they might give you just a little bit of context. So um, in 2022, we had a 
about 8,100 uh, challenge participants. This is only people who registered for that first um, challenge itself. That doesn't include anybody who just came in because of summer at your library or programs or who we engaged with um, just while we were out at community events. That's just people who chose to really do the summer challenge itself. We did have around 220 programs, both in library and online. Last year was our return to in-person um, programming. So this number is a bit lower than you will see this year. In fact, it's actually quite a bit lower than you'll see this year. Um, and it really also does not include any of the kind of like pop-up programs that our library staff did or the kind of ongoing patron-driven things that might've been just going on throughout the summer. We were able to reach about 2,000 children through really targeted outreach. So this was two programs um, that might have served children that were struggling academically or might have been low income or persons of color who had less opportunity to get into the library. And we did that by working with um, almost 30 partner sites. In fact, actually, I suspect that number is a bit higher, but we were just getting um, on our tracking of these things last summer. Um, this number is very specific to that targeted outreach where we were able to connect with those kiddos. It doesn't include the thousands of other people that we reached through just community events and celebrations and all sorts of other great tabling and promotional opportunities we had. And this is just a little bit of a timeline. I won't go over all of it with you, but I like to throw it in here, if nothing else, to show you that um, summer never actually ends for me. Um, by the time we were wrapping up summer of last year, we were starting to talk about summer of this year. So it just kind of is an ongoing cycle of something that we're constantly working on and building on and looking to improve and get closer to meeting those goals. And so all of that, maybe, there we go, has <laughs> led us to 2023. Summer hasn't actually started yet, um, and yet we already have some numbers. Um, so far, we've had 23 libraries and departments engaged in this. That is every single one of our um, community libraries. We have had departments like CATS and CMD and facilities and purchasing, accounting, uh, program and outreach, volunteers. That's actually who's in these photos. We had uh, fantastic corporate volunteers from HP and IQ Credit Union come in and help us get ready. Um, and then, of course, the Library Foundation. So oodles and oodles of people helping to make this possible. We have put in over 680 staff hours between planning and prepping and all sorts of other components that go into this. We have purchased 285 grand prize pieces. Uh, they look really fun and engaging. And of course, that's our goal. We want people to continue with the program and keep going. But these are also um, prizes that will be helpful in kids getting closer to those goals. So we'll have board games to help support learning and communication, high interest books to encourage continued reading, hands-on activities for creativity and exploration. And we're really excited that there will be three prize baskets at every single one of our libraries this summer for folks to have a chance to win. And then we've also ordered almost 6,400 prize books um, because a huge component of our Summer at Your Library program the last two years has been able to offer a book to every single person who registers for the program. Uh, we made that shift just last year and it was incredibly well received. And one of the things that we really appreciated about it was that if a person didn't finish the program, which we of course want them to finish the challenge, but if they didn't, we knew that worst comes to worst, they had a book in their hand and what were they gonna do with that book? We were gonna read it. So everybody got a book, which was very, very exciting for us. So yeah, all of that kind of went into putting together those three pieces. And so, as I said, our challenge is made up of kind of those four elements that read, create, learn, and explore. Read is what everybody thinks of when they think of the library, of course. It's a huge element for us. And so we challenge everybody to read for 30 days this summer. We don't have a minimum amount of pages or books that they need to read. We encourage patrons to set their own reading goal because we know that building a daily reading habit is beneficial for both our littlest readers and our adults, everybody in between. We also really encourage them to uh, read whatever works for them. All reading counts. So for our teens and our adults, it might be you know, fiction or nonfiction that's a ton of text and not a lot of pictures but it could also be graphic novels. It could be a lot of nonfiction that is a mixture of um, pictures and text. It could be them reading to a early learner or being read to if they are an early learner, or it could even be them listening to an audiobook. All of those things are gonna help them build fluency and comprehension and vocabulary skills, and also just put together a much uh, better feeling about reading and a positive vibe for it, which is something we, we always go for. In addition to reading, of course, we do want them to create one thing, 
that could be a masterpiece or it could be a new recipe. It could be whatever they like to really customize that challenge to make it work for them. We want them to learn something. It doesn't have to be cracking a textbook or busting out the uh, flashcards, but it could be learning a new language. Uh, it could be learning how to read a map. It could be going out on a little bit of a nature walk and learning about what they see. And then finally, we want them to explore one new thing. This could be in their backyard, or it could be going on a great road trip, which is what our mascots are doing this summer. Really, we just want to encourage people to not hang out on their sofa all summer and get out and try and explore something. So as I said, that piece is our challenge, and we have a lot of other elements that we try and help put together to really help support the challenge, but also help support those goals. So one of those is programs, and a lot of our programs help patrons meet those challenges that we've issued to folks. Um, and we do have programs for all ages and all interests. A lot of our branches really take the opportunity during the summer to have some great performers in that they wouldn't be able to do during the school year. They might come and talk about wolves or... Uh, reptiles or demonstrate some amazing Aztec dance or even some bilingual juggling, all sorts of really fun things. But it also might be more hands-on activities, things that either our summer committee has put together or our fantastic staff has put together. Might be things like, you know, exploring their creativity by making their own books or learning about some STEM skills, some science, technology, engineering, or math skills by trying to protect an egg from a perilous drop. Um, really just different things to keep kids engaged. We have these things both in the library and online. While a lot of our programming has transitioned back to in-person, we did realize that one of the benefits to putting things online is it increased accessibility for a lot of our folks. So we will have four performers that are hosted um, on our YouTube channel all summer long. So everybody can watch them whenever they would like. And then we will also have multiple OMSI um, live sessions through Zoom this summer. So a variety of ways for folks to engage with us. And then we'll also um, have our third annual Librantics uh, video challenge. This is something we've been doing for the last few summers and another one that we had in the fall. And this is all sorts of challenges that are issued and folks get a chance to um, see our staff be a little silly as we give it a try. And then they get to go ahead and give it a try themselves. And we've had a lot of luck with this the last few years. It runs multiple weeks and patrons have the opportunity to earn some gift cards but they also just get a chance to be silly and engage with us in that way. And one of the really fun ones about this is we've seen a lot of engagement from our smaller libraries like Goldendale and Yale and Yakult, more so than we've seen in some of our other programs. So that's been kind of a, a nice boom of that one. And then we have a lot of other opportunities for folks to um, check out some additional activities and things in our guides. We'll have all of this information up on our website. We even have an online guide that's got some book lists and information on doing their own DIY. Um, book clubs and all sorts of other stuff. And then of course, that third piece is outreach. So we are just getting started with this for the summer, but outreach is really our way, as I said, to really connect with folks who aren't able to come to us. And for us, it's not just bringing a stack of stuff and running away. Oftentimes it's bringing activities, it's bringing information, it's bringing the same resources we would have in our library out to kiddos who might not be able to come to us. And so we work with a variety of partners to do that. These are just a few of the ones that we've already started talking with. Some of these might be through community events. Others of these might be through visits that we go ahead and we, as I said, bring a good old you know, DIY book activity and we talk to them about summer and we do all sorts of things. So we've had some of those ones. We've also had a variety of other ones coming up. One of the ones that a lot of our communities are really able to connect with, I always like to highlight, are the free summer meal sites. Those are ones that are throughout almost all of our service area. Um, and in addition to actually trying to connect with them, our downtown Vancouver library also is host to one of those free meal sites. So, um, but in addition to them, we have a variety of other partners we work with to help us connect with those kiddos. So that's kind of your run through of kind of what we've done and what we're planning for this year. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Can you tell us the theme for this summer? Yeah, so we've been trying to go with kind of a loose theme, although we've really fallen in love with these cryptids, which we had last year. So cryptids are like Bigfoot and Kraken and Loch Ness Monster. So last year, our phenomenal um, graphics uh, team came up with these. And then this year, we are sending them on a road trip. So it's kind of a, a road trip theme, but with our, our cryptid friends. So they're going to take a trek around uh, Southwest Washington, around to all of our libraries. and. Um, 
see what see what there is to see. So thank. Did you have a question? I thought I heard it. Someone online or anything? No? Yeah. So quick question. So in your initial first or second slide, somewhere you mentioned that there is a learning program for the kids or support for the kids who can't read or need some assistance. Can you please elaborate a little bit on that? What kind of program do we run? Hmm. I think that might have, I apologize if I've got some misunderstanding on that one. We don't have an official program to teach uh, reading to children over the summer. We have, let's see. Yeah, so with our goals here, we do have a, a goal to help support the children that are really um, most likely to need it. And often we do that by partnering with those partners that are actively working with kids. There's a lot of research that shows unless you're actually hosting a program that is like ongoing four hours a day, the same kids day after day after day, which is not something the library is able to sustain, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to, to do that kind of um, learning directly, but we can work with the folks who are able to do that. So things like summer schools, meal sites, childcare throughout the summer. And so we work with them to help connect the resources they might have or might be lacking. So for example, bringing them the books that they might not have on site so that they can help support the work that they're doing or bringing hands-on activity to encourage that participation, which again is something that some of those sites might not have readily available. Okay, so do we have any collaboration with those kind of institutes we, for, for this support the children for learning right for this particular program yeah forgive me i'm not quite sure i heard all of the question yeah so the organizations in particular thank you that's the question i was missing so yes organizations like esd 112 they work with a lot of the school districts throughout our service area they actually are the the overarching support for most of the school districts um working with folks like let's see reach is another service um uh, or pardon me reach is actually part of esd 112 out here in the gorge um, that works with a lot of school students in particular for that kind of service. Um, and then honestly, some of the summer meal sites provide that service um, as part of their work. They don't just do meal service. They're part of the summer school program or a summer parks program. And so often those are the ones doing that kind of um, targeted work. And these are not everybody we will be working with. These are just the folks that have already contacted us for the year, but we've also often work with summer schools as well, but they don't have their details usually available to us for another month or so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Not hearing any other questions. <laughs> thank you, Kelsey, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Next up is Stevenson Community Library Branch Report with David Wyatt. Oh, it has a laser pointer too. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, yes, so I'm David Wyatt. I'm the branch manager for Stevenson, um, North Bonneville, and then the uh, Skamini County Bookmobile as well, um, which is parked just outside. Um, and it has not been that long since you all have been here last, um, just since October. So a little off my, uh, regular, um, pattern of reporting things out. Let's see here. I must not be confident enough. Oh, was that you or me? Okay. Okay. Well, I'm, I was going to start with um, our friends at the library. Um, so obviously they support us through all the volunteer work they do. Um, there's um, our friend's president, Kathy Edwards. Um, she participated in a photo shoot that was um, here um, last year. Um, and then um, down here, um, there's some volunteers at the book sale that we had at the end of April. 
Um, and then um, late last year, um, the local chamber of commerce had an award ceremony and the Friends organization was voted best business. Nonprofits can be um, nominated as well. Um, best business of the year. Um, so that's me with several of the friends when they accepted the award. Um, they have a couple of very large programs that happen every year. Um, one towards the end of the year in October is a big art show, um, but the one that's coming up or we're in the middle of now is uh, Skamania County Reads. Um, so um, we tried to bring in an author. Um, this year it's Brian Fies. He wrote and illustrated a graphic novel memoir called a uh, fire story about his experience um, losing his house to a wildfire in northern california um, back in 2017. Um, so he's going to be visiting on may 25th giving a talk um, but before that uh, we'll be partnered with um, a couple of the local schools um, and he'll be doing um, workshops um, with middle and high school students um, so um, one of those schools is the Pacific Crest Innovation Academy. Um, they're up in Mille, and some of their students have done the artwork that's along that wall, um, but they'll be visiting the library, doing the workshop with them, and having some time to um, use the library resources as well, um, because, you know, they're about half an hour away from the library, so they don't get here all the time. Um, so that's just a taste of the things that the friends do for us. Um, and then, of course, staff. Um, so we have seven staff, including myself total, um, just over six um, full-time equivalents. So we have a couple of part-time people. Um, and three of them drive the bookmobile um, going out all over the place. Um, so in these pictures, we have one of our bookmobile drivers, Janine, and then one of the assistants that goes out with her, um, Autumn, um, on one of the days that the bookmobile was not functioning. And um, they took the library scion and delivered books to some of their regular stops, um, just kind of doing that extra bit to get books into the hands of kids. Um, and then the other image up here is Jane. Um, she is one of the staff members in the district um, that um, also speaks Spanish. Um, so she does one of our outreach um, story times in the summer down at our farmer's market. Um, and last year, we only did that once a month, um, but it went so well. And the farmer's market was happy with what we were doing that we're going to be doing it twice a month this year. Um, yeah, so I'll just skip to the next one because that's going to show kind of the whole area that we serve. So down here in Stevenson, but we take the bookmobile from up here all the way up here and up into Trout Lake and Glenwood even and hit some stuff down near White Salmon as well. Um, so between those three service points, it's about, I think I had it on the previous slide, 68 hours of open hours to the public, which is about the equivalent of the number of open hours, say like VA has, um, but it's just spread out all over the county. Um, the bookmobile itself is a ton of investment in staff and time and all sorts of resources, um, but it spends about 25 hours on the week, um, 25 hours in a week on the road and it translates into about 14 hours of actually being open to the public because it takes us about an hour to drive up the Glenwood, you know, that sort of thing. Um, let's see here. So that's kind of just a breakdown of the three different service points. So obviously where we are now, actually right there, um, the hours were open here weeks, 48 were um, Monday through Saturday. Um, and has our CERC numbers and visits. Um, I'm sure you've heard that, you know, we're all a little bit lower than we were in 2019. And that more or less holds here. Um, I'd say the bookmobile is an exception. It's been pretty steady throughout. Um, and North Bonneville is a little low too, but 
North Bonneville has the fewest hours. Um, we only have that open to the public with staff um, six hours a week. Um, but one benefit we do have is that it is within the city hall um, of North Bonneville and um, people are able to pick up their holds whenever city hall is open. So even if we don't have staff there, um, patrons can pick up their holds. Um, And then these are some of our community partners and outreach. Um, being such a wide geographic area, we have lots of opportunities for partnerships. So I mentioned the Pacific Crest Innovation Academy, um, the farmer's market. Um, we host um, one of the few tax aid help things out in this area. Um, let's see here, what else? Uh, we regularly have um, a blood drive here as well, um, work with WSU Extension. We had been visiting with um, a small vehicle, um, some of the um, uh, fishing access sites along the river with um, the, the, the um, crit fit, um, Columbia, Columbia River. Thank you. I always just call it crit fit. <laughs> um, but we had been visiting there with um, one of our vehicles, bringing books to give out to kids and that sort of thing. Um, and we're slowly transitioning into um, full-on bookmobile stops. Um, we have a bookmos bookmobile stop at um, one of the fishing access sites um, in White Salmon. And we're exploring um, this fall doing one that's by Bonneville as well. Um, the other thing that I was really excited about that we partnered on recently um, was an all-day um, workshop with an organization called Braver Angels. Um, the district had worked with them prior to COVID um, and um, hosted just like a one-off info session about how to talk to people with different political ideologies. Um, and in this room, when we did that before COVID, the room was packed with people. I was kind of surprised. Um, and so we had originally planned to have one of their all-day workshops uh, in 2020 before 2020 became 2020. Um, and we were able to partner with them just recently, um, just the last month, and it was a red-blue workshop. So they had... Um, groups of red and blue leaning participants that worked through exercises and how to have productive conversations with each other. And it was 10 to five, it was all day. Um, I don't know, it was just, it was, it was a really good experience. Um, and everybody came to it with their best intentions and there were 40 people that participated in that. Um, so that was really cool. Um, that's really, oh no, the picture's gone. It was the back of the bookmobile going away. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's about all I had for you all today. Um, but I welcome any questions. Not hearing any. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate it. Next up is Atar Bengal with the March 2023 financial statements. Good evening. Uh, we have tonight the uh, March 2023 financial statements starting with, um, if we could uh, go back up to 10, the statement of cash. Yes, this one. No, sorry, 11. Statement of cash. Thank you. 
All right. So at the end of March, uh, year to date revenues were at $2.2 million and year to date expenditures at $7.4 million. Cash balance was $15.5 million. And then if we could proceed to the next uh, page, statement of revenues. If you keep uh, going down just a bit more. All right. So uh, for property tax revenue for March, uh, property tax totaled uh, $1.8 million. Year to date is at 7.37, excuse me, 7.37% of budget. Um, compared to 8% this time last year. Uh, March leasehold excise uh, tax revenue was $905 and state forest boards uh, $7.3,000. <clears throat> Charges for services brought in $4,400 uh, for the month. And if we scroll down just a bit to the miscellaneous section, um, <clears throat> March investment interest was $25,800. And then total March revenue was $1.9 million. Um, so year-to-date budget percentage for total operating revenue was 7.05%. Uh, then we move on to the statement of expenses. All right. Uh, at the end of uh, March, we would expect uh, total expenses for the year to be at 25% of budget. Uh, March personnel costs were $1.3 million with year to date at 23.46% of budget compared to 21.93% this time last year. Running lower than budget due to 28 open positions. Supplies, uh, if we can uh, scroll down just a bit. Uh, supplies and small equipment um, came in at $125,000 uh, with year-to-date at 16%. Uh, library materials came in at uh, $300, $361,000 with year-to-date at 21.39%. All right. And then um, under other services, excuse me, under other services charges, professional services came in at $117,000. Repair and maintenance at $133,000. Um, we also had communications at $36,800 and utilities at $45,000. Both of those are running high. Um, and then moving on to capital outlay. Um, capital outlay uh, had $494,600, um, mostly consisting of the uh, Union Corner Construction progress payment for the remodel on the new operations center on Grand Boulevard and the architect payments on the Woodland, build, on the, uh, Woodland uh, Building Project. Total March expenditures were $2.7 million um, and then year-to-date budget percentage for total expenditures is at 21.89%. Uh, Questions? Okay, thank you. You're not hearing any questions. All right, thank you. And then next we have Rick Smithrood with the FERL Foundation Report. Good evening. It's nice to be here with you. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share some good news from the foundation. About two weeks ago, we did our fifth uh, Love Your Library event at the Peterson's Red Barn in Woodland. And it was a great event. It was a beautiful night. And the event included both silent and live auctions, an outstanding display of delicious food, and a delightful gathering of some of Woodland's nicest people. In addition to all the Woodland folk, I appreciate that uh, Megan and Marie and Amelia and uh, Jennifer Juan uh, from the uh, Woodland branch were there. We also had uh, some of the foundation board members were there volunteering and working. And of course the foundation staff was there, but thank you so much for being there, appreciate it. Uh, we have, uh, in addition to some last minute donations and paying a few final bills, but we're pretty confident that it raised just over $26,000 for the Woodland Library Building Fund. So that was a good step forward. I have more good news. Uh, we have started working on the 21st uh, Authors and Illustrator Dinner which will be held October 17th at the Vancouver Hilton. It's a dinner and silent auction and things are coming together nicely. We've already uh, secured the, the venue with the Hilton. We've secured our 
uh, relationship with the Colombian. We've secured our presenting sponsor, which is Columbia Credit Union. We have about 10 of our previous sponsors who have signed on to repeat for this year. And we've added several uh, new sponsors for this year. Our ticket uh, site and sales to the public are expected to begin at the end of June or early July. And our speaker is going to be David Baldacci, who is internationally known. He has 47 novels out for adults. He's sold over 150 million books. He, they've been translated into 45 languages and he's sold in 80 countries. And then he has seven books for the younger generations, just so the people have, if any of those teens wanna read some of these books. Uh, I also wanna share with you some things about the foundation that you may not recognize because we're still learning and you're, some of you are new to the found, or to uh, getting used to the foundation. So I want to share some of the things. We are about relationships. We go out in the community and we build relationships with all sorts of people for all sorts of things. And one of those uh, that we work with is individuals and families. We often get a call or a letter. And uh, sometimes we feel like we may hear just about as many library stories as the staff at the different branches do, uh, because people always want to share their story before they talk about making their gift. But it comes from all sorts of, and sometime when I have more time, I will tell you the some of the tearjerker stories I've had about people whose lifelong experience uh, with libraries has changed their lives. So, but not tonight. Uh, we also get tremendous support from businesses. So uh, those businesses that you will see at almost all of the events we put on or that we are part of participate uh, or host. Uh, has a list of sponsors with it. The programs that we support at the library often have a long list of sponsors with it. Uh, when we're not asking them to be sponsors, those businesses are also donating product or services or volunteers or something to help us out. Um, and so we're very grateful for all those businesses that do that. Um, and we, uh, we depend on that. Now, as an example, with the authors and illustrators, we usually have a silent auction that has about 200 auction items in it but we contact over 800 businesses. And sometimes the package that you see and bid on contains multiple pieces from different businesses, but it's a, it's a great way to go. Um, Foundation also has a long history of doing special event fundraisers. Uh, what's great about special events is because we've done a little bit of everything. We've done Oktoberfest uh, for many years at Shorty's uh, Home and Garden. We do the dinner, we did the dinner in white on the Columbia. Uh, we did dinner, a novel night in Washougal, which was kind of a farm to table dinner, uh, not on the list, but we do it is things like special events like Beaches Cashback Day and other types of fundraisers that uh, people are involved in. And again, it's a partnership and it's uh, our relationship with those businesses and those people who want to have fun and support the library. So um, let's see. And we also did one, you may remember, uh, Savor the Couve uh, for several years during COVID where people would come down and buy meals at Warehouse 23 and pick them up and take them home as a way of supporting the library. Uh, we also do uh, grants and grants are kind of interesting because we have, we work with foundations, donor advised funds, government agencies and businesses. And uh, so and what's interesting about grants is there's a lot of paperwork involved, not only when you apply for a grant, large or small, but at the back end of doing grants, there's always the uh, re grant reports that have to be written. And there's also uh, usually different tracking and, and information that has to be recorded about grants. And we're also required to know something about planned gifts. So we are lately have been working with uh, the population is aging next. Um, We've been working with the boomer generation, which is, you know, like me turning gray. And uh, they do things like bequests, gifts of stock, required minimum distribution gifts from their retirement accounts, gifts of real property, endowments. Um, and uh, so that involves a lot of technical work on some of those gifts to make sure that they're recorded and reported rightly and that the donors receive the correct information on their receipts. And we also like to... Uh, we sometimes have to work with third, third party investments in order to make sure that uh, everything is recorded properly. And then we also have uh, one of the services and one of the things that we do is investments. Each of the friends groups has an investment account and we have several other investment accounts. 
And we have a fantastic group of business people who have volunteered to serve on our investment committee for the last 20 some years. And Elizabeth, that's next slide. Thank you. And the, those investments, we use one of them, uh, Ruth will like this, white salmon. We use their account as, as one of them as a benchmark because once they deposited money way long time ago, they haven't added to or subtracted to it. Everything you see there is the growth from just investing the money. And uh, another example that I will give to you is that the Friends of La Center um, had a $10,000 CD. That's where they thought they should be investing. And over a 10 year period, that CD earned $800 they decided to put it into a foundation investment account. And within two years, they had earned $2,500 on that $10,000. So it all depends. And again, I'm so grateful to people who serve on the foundation's investment committee. We have 26 different uh, investment accounts that we monitor and manage with a, a group of professionals. And the nice thing is, is that the people who we work with, it's about the relationship and they do it at a discount fee because they believe in supporting the library foundation and the library. So uh, next, and then the, the last thing is you may know that all of the friends groups are under the umbrella of the foundation. We share our 501c3 number. We have a relationship with all of these friends groups. All of their accounts are under our tax ID number. And they are just the most fantastic people in the world because they are giving the most impression, important gift that we can receive, which gifts of their time. So as volunteers, as supporters, as boosters, as advocates, uh, we're so deeply grateful for all the friends of the library, people that we get to work with, and uh, that makes them some amazing donors. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Oh, I hear is somebody um, trying to ask a question online. Can I ask a question, Ruth? Marie, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Rick, that was a fantastic event that you put on in Woodland with you and your team and the friends. It was just a very beautiful venue and a nice event. I'm curious what that cost to put on was 26,000 revenue or was part of that taken away with the cost of putting that on? No, this is the important part okay. is because again, it's about relationships. So the, the proceeds were $26,000. The Petersons donated the barn for our use. The musician performed oh. pro, bono, pro bono. Um, the food was donated. Judy uh, went and collected food from a number of different locations got meat donated, got vegetables donated, got different dishes donated, got seafood donated, the silent auction baskets were donated. Uh, everything that went into that evening, except for some minor expenses for decorations and a few other small things was donated because the people came together and wanted to do that event to support the library. And that's just about the way we do every event when we do the authors and illustrators. Oh, super. Thank you. We're hearing about every other word. I had a question for uh, Rick. Um, go ahead, Penny. Uh, I was curious about uh, what we make each year on this uh, Love Your Library over the years. Has it been increasing each year as you have this event? Because I think you said there had been five years of it. Correct. And, and I think this year was... A little lighter than some of the other years, uh, and that was mainly due, I think, to the heat and to the fact that the same people have been coming to that event for uh, five years. And so it's hard when people are familiar with it to, you know, if there's other things going on. Um, but uh, as it just happens that sometimes you have a few more or a few less, but it's uh, it was still a great event and we're really pleased and you add up the total from those five years and uh, it's a significant amount of money towards the new library. Um, so, and I will say that the authors and illustrator varies a little bit too, just based on who the author is. And so we're expecting already, we're projecting that we'll have at least 700 people for the authors and illustrator dinner in October. So, which will be a, a positive. We've had as many as 900 uh, two years. And uh, 
So we're looking forward to it. We're excited. Um, my other uh, question was, have you considered changing events since you're saying that people are attending less because they've been getting the, the same program? Will there be a new program for to raise the rest of the funds? Absolutely. We're always coming up with new things. Actually, Judy and I have been uh, talking about some some new uh, different types of fundraisers that we could do to kind of stir things up. So you may be seeing and hearing some new ideas that are rolling out that will be used very soon. And I think you'll like them. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Uh, my other question involves uh, when you were talking about uh, the different accounts that you have invested. Uh, and I see that you're getting quite a bit of interest. Is the interest uh, rolled over or is it used for other things? Uh, no, at this time, well, the accounts are usually named and the interest goes with the purpose or, or stays with the account that's earning it. And that's that's a decision by the foundation board of uh, directors. So that's kind of what, the way we've been tracking things. So like a friend's investment account, when it goes up, it, it stays with the friend's account. And, and what about the foundation's account? Do they ever use or do you ever use the interest for your uh, expenses that you have? Only only on occasion, and that's just because uh, sometimes uh, we, we have to, we have expenses that are higher than normal or something like that. And, um, and we have an unrestricted account that we use for that purpose. Okay, I, I was just curious, because I know that like uh, when you had the uh, fundraiser at Beaches, I think it was, now the money from the beaches one, does it go to a specific program for the library or how's that used? It goes in, it goes into what would be considered our operating fund. And then it could be used for either to pay bills or to pay expenses. And some of it may go to the library. Some of it may go cover operating expenses. It's kind of, it goes into that pool. The interesting thing is the foundation is uh, self-sufficient. We pay all of our own bills. We not we don't receive any money for staff or uh, we pay our operating expenses from the district. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's hard to tell if people are gonna ask questions, okay. So we'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda as presented? I, um, sorry, this is Megan. I reviewed the FBRL expenditures for April um, and they were all in order in the amount of $2,320,673.88. And uh, the minutes I gave um, Rhonda one small spelling correction. And with that, I move that we approve the consent agenda. Seconded. Any further discussion? I move this to a vote. Could we get a roll call vote, please? Megan Dugan? Aye. Olga Hodges? Aye. Marine Coffee? Aye. Aye. Uh, Vikram Katwani. Aye. Uh, Penny Love Hensley. Aye. And Christy Morgan. Aye. And then finally, we have Mary Ann Duncan Cole. Aye. Motion to approve the consent agenda is adopted. As approved. Sorry. We'll move on to. Um, the business portion of our meeting, starting off with the finance committee, um, fee forgiveness for minors at 18. Um, I'm just going to ask Lynn to step up if they would to um, potentially answer any questions we might have. This is something that the board discussed last month and asked us to bring a resolution to you for approval this month. Um, there's a short staff report available in their board packet. Did you have a presentation or are you just taking questions? Uh, no, I did that last month. Great. I just, if you had any questions. Does anyone have questions? I know we reviewed this pretty in depth last time. Um, I'm not hearing any questions. Okay. 
So the recommendation is for us to approve, um, let me find it. Um, Res Christy, I move that we approve resolution 2023-11, find forgiveness for minors at 18. Thank you, is there a second? All seconds. Move this to a roll, or I'm sorry, is there any further discussion on this item? A, a short quick question. So when we say fine forgiveness for minors at 18, is it when they reach 18, will all the fines be forgiven or is it before that? When they reach 18. Okay, right. thank you. Any further questions or discussion? Okay, we can move this to a roll call vote, please. I have a question. Go ahead. Can you hear me okay? I, I could hear you. Yes, please go. Do we have a way of letting the minors know? Um, We can, uh, we, we haven't worked out all of the procedures yet, but if they have contact information that's up to date, we could develop something. Did that answer your question, Olga? Thank you, yep. All right, we can move this to a roll call vote, please. Marianne Duncan Cole. Aye. Megan Dugan? Aye. Marie Coffey? Aye. Vikram Katwani? Aye. Penny Love Hensley? Aye. Olga Hodges? Aye. And Kirsty Morgan? Aye. We move to approve resolution 2023 11, fee forgiveness for minors as approved. Thank you guys. This was a good one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next up is Ridgefield tax increment financing area information. Oh, thank you. We already heard a little bit this evening from um, Duncan Brown about this. Um, you'll see that there's still some preliminary information within the staff report. Um, they're projecting about $4 million in lost revenue to FBRL over a 25 year period. Um, it'll start out at a lower number, probably around $25,000 a year and grow to about $200,000 a year if that property is, increases in value as predicted. Um, I'm waiting for final numbers. Uh, actually, I'm waiting for a report that they are required to provide to us. Right now, it looks like they are planning their first public hearing towards the end of June, and I'll keep you informed about that if you're interested. That should be available online. Um, again, as we discussed earlier, there's really nothing we can do about this. This is up to these jurisdictions um, to choose to implement these things. Um, I can tell you that the fire department is fired up um, and concerned about um, how this will impact them. It's about a $19 million um, decrease in potential revenue to the fire district, uh, Clark County and Cowlitz Fire District. Um, so they do have a lot more at stake than we do. Um, but it's still, as these continue to um, get created, I've heard that the Port of Ridgefield is also considering a TIP and I expect more to come. And uh, Atar and I've talked a little bit, but we are hoping to meet with the County Assessor's Office to talk some more about how this will get sorted out and, and um, what the impact will look like for us on an annual basis. Questions or discussion? This is Penny. I, I was going to ask, uh, is this the issue that we are anticipating some lawsuits on the constitutionality of the tax? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's, it's beginning to really spread across the state. The Port of Vancouver was the first one. Um, and as you heard Duncan describe, they needed a legislative fix. So that happened. Um, in this legislative session, um, but that didn't um, do anything for us. So um, 
I, I do believe there will be more to come on this. Um, I don't think there'll be anything we can do about the ones that have been put in place, but it might change how they're implemented in the future. Okay, thank you. Not hearing any further discussion, we can move on to facilities committee. Um, Woodland Community Library information. Um, I wanted to make sure that everyone on the board knew that we will be um, hosting a- Can I back up? Penny, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead to me. Marie, go ahead, please. <laughs> I have one more question for Amelia to clarify what I thought her, her, her. Marie, you're cutting out pretty bad to where we can't understand your question. If you would like to type hey. it, that might be better. Hey. Hey. Can, can you hear me? Could you please type your question in the chat, Marie? It is that the city council Richfield is putting this out to, to, to get public. Is the city of Ridgefield asking for public input? Is the question? Yes, um, I believe Marie. The date will be June twenty seventh. I'll have a public hearing. In and they haven't made a decision yet or clarify that, please um, I, I believe the city intends to go forward with it but they are required to have two public hearings as part of that process um, so the first one will be June 27th and that'll be your opportunity um, to share your thoughts with Um, we will continue on then with Woodland Community Library. So I just want to let the board know we are planning a uh, groundbreaking in conjunction with the foundation and the Friends of the Woodland Library. For I can. June 17th. Um, and Judy, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's 2 p.m. on the 17th. Um, and um, I know Judy's been working hard lining up um, a lot of little activities for that day. I know Burgerville is supporting um, us as a sponsor. And um, I just ran into um, Representative Ed Orcutt and invited him to come. Um, so I know we're also kind of put together that um, list of dignitaries. Um, but anyway, we would love to have any and all of you there. It's kind of a big deal for us to break ground on the building. Um, so I'll keep you informed about that, but I wanted to be sure you got that on your calendars. Um, and then the other thing to tell you is that we are uh, nearing 100% construction drawings on that project. Um, once we have a complete set, we will be putting the project out to bid. We anticipate doing that in early June um, with bids due in early July. And so um, as this project kind of goes forward, we'll be keeping you informed about uh, both the progress and the um, yeah, how the bids come in. Um, but we're excited that uh, we're just about there. Thank you. If if you have questions, maybe you could just type it directly into chat and we have someone watching the chat box. Um, so if you have questions or discussion, feel free to type it now. Um, I'll give you just a few seconds. We'll move on to the Vancouver Parking Agreement action. And actually, item B was the Grand Boulevard um, no, I'm sorry. and the foundation. And I just wanted to inform the board, and I, I think you are aware that um, the foundation has let us know that the office space we offered them in our new building on Grand Boulevard was inadequate for their needs. Um, so they've chosen to move to other offices. Um, I do not know um, the location of those offices or the cost. I don't have any details on that. Um, but I wanted to inform you um, that um, 
we are moving forward with the Grand Boulevard um, project. We are still planning on moving. I believe July 10th is our move date, um, start of our move date, and um, things are going well um, with the project. So, I just if you like, yeah, you move right on. You bet. Um, so, the right of first refusal limited waiver, resolution 2023 12, um, the um, Fort Vancouver Regional Library District received property in um, as a donation from Evergreen Investors LLC um, that is the land on which the downtown Vancouver Library is built. We only own the building and five feet. Uh, around it of property that the building sits on. The rest of the land is owned by Evergreen. Um, the city of Vancouver, if you recall from this past week, I shared an article with you, um, has made an offer that has been accepted on that property and they're um, seeking to close. And one of the features of the original agreement that Fort Vancouver uh, negotiated for that property was a right of first refusal should anyone ever go to purchase the property um, on the parking lot, specifically on the land that encompasses the parking lot. Um, in the years that I've been here, I have spoken to Killian um, Pacific, um, who is Evergreen um, Investors LLC, about the possibility of FVRL being by being able to buy a portion of that property because we couldn't afford um, the, the full amount. Um, the city is um, estimated to be paying about $12 million for the property all in. Um, but I did talk to Killian off and on about possibly purchasing a portion of the land, and um, they've always had let me know that they were not interested in selling only a portion of the land. It is it is an all or nothing um, package, and so the city and Killian Pacific or Evergreen um, have a lease on the parking lot. The city manages the lot for FVRL. They monitor parking there and make sure that people don't stay more than two hours. Um, they maintain the lights, the stripes, and things like that. So it's been a good um, relationship um, for FVRL. The city actually uh, constructed the parking lot. Um, and again, the land all belongs as part of this package that um, Evergreen owns. So what the city is seeking um, is a waiver of our right of first refusal um, on that sale. We do not have the financial resources to buy that property. Um, however, I, I'm, what I'm seeking tonight is um, your approval to allow me to negotiate um, with the city on um, what we can get for um, both the um, parking agreement that we have at that location, because of course we need and, and want more parking in that location. And that's our hope is that the city will be seeking to build additional spaces for a future park and ride that'll be part of the I-5 um, bridge um, master plan. Um, but also to ensure that in the future there is parking for library patrons. Um, my biggest fear is that if it becomes a park and ride, it will be all all day parking. And I want to be sure that something is reserved for library patrons so that they don't have to fight for parking spaces adjacent to our building. Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure how that plays out. My, my thinking is there needs to be short term parking as well as all day parking to ensure that some spaces are set aside. Um, you know, if you have um, some kind of validated parking, do you show your library card? <laughs> you know, how, do, how will we figure that out? I don't know, but I'd like to see that whatever agreement we get includes some consideration for the library. Um, additionally, as I've shared with you, the foundation holds a million dollars in um, one of their investment accounts specifically for the development of Library Plaza. Library Plaza was a vision of many years ago of the parking, uh, underground parking garage that was to be built as part of the library project that was never realized because of the 2008 recession. The foundation continues to hold that money and I'm hoping that might um, provide some uh, leverage for us at the point where the city begins to develop the land. Honestly, I, the city's indicated they may not develop that land for some time. It could be even 10 more years before it gets developed. Um, but we have that obligated um, uh, money set aside. And um, you can see right here in the, um, both our resolution and in the city's um, right to waiver, um, they mentioned Library Square. So um, they're anticipating that this is what this area will be called, um, or at least that's what it's called right now. Um, so tonight, I'm really just seeking uh, your authority to continue to negotiate um, with the city as they seek to purchase this property. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, quick question, Amelia. 
so uh, once they buy the land right and as you mentioned it might take them 10 years or more depending on how the project goes so can we get a temporary usage for the library included in your negotiations we can you know have like a even a gravel parking lot you know to start with if you don't want to spend any money on that front but it will give us a parking lot for next 10 years right yes, and it... later we can you know you can put it like they can give some amount of parking when when the build is complete yes and i think if you read the city's um waiver that they provided to us it does envision us taking over that parking lease um, that they currently hold with evergreen um, would transfer to us and we would continue to have a lease on that parking lot and there's it's currently free um, there's no money exchanged between evergreen and the city and and i envision that would remain the same that that lot would continue to be free to the library one of the things that i think if if you you know for the folks who were here when this um, passed on the ballot um, for the VLC up there, the Vancouver Library Capital Facilities area, there was a promise of parking spaces for this project from the city. There is a, we call it the elevator to nowhere in the building that goes below ground to be there for that future parking garage. You know, so we, the district has already put a big investment into um, parking um, that hasn't come to fruition. So I, the city understands that. And I, I think that's the main thing we want to be sure we negotiate for is to make sure that, that some of that parking in the future is available to the library. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. One thing that's critical is that loading area. And so I, and again, your property lines five feet from the building around. Can you secure that so that you can protect that? Um, that's part of our, our current yeah. agreement. Yep. Thank you for asking them. Vic, did I answer all your questions? Uh, yes. So I was also talking more, not just the current parking lot that will be there forever for, uh, you know, library, but for that three acre additional area, right? We can use part of that as a additional parking if city agrees to that and they should be okay considering they won't be developing anything for the next 10 years. Yeah, and I think that's the hard part is, you know, when it gets developed and how it gets developed. If it's a light rail station, how many tracks are coming in, how big the station needs to be, how much of the current property that is reserved, West Reserve Street becomes part of the park and ride. Um, I, you know, it, it is I five widened. I mean, there's just a lot of questions we have. I've heard one vision that's actually like a, oh, kind of a, a platform that would cap the interstate right there. So uh, similar to some other cities where you build infrastructure on top of the freeway. I've seen a suggestion of that happening uh, to even create some more um, space, you know, to kind of enhance the, both the fort and the downtown area. So I think, you know, there's a lot on the table for the city. I think this is really important to them to control this property in particular and how it gets developed um, so that it's advantageous for the city as the bridge gets built. Yeah, and also, can we put some wording in the agreement, like if in the future city changes its plan, you know, changes the plans and decides not to develop it, but they can carve out a piece for our parking lot? So, if I hear you correctly, we should have a right of first refusal <laughs> um, with the city of Vancouver. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that they should decide to sell it, that we retain that right of first refusal. Um, with them that we've had with Evergreen. I think that's an excellent suggestion. I do have a question about the very last paragraph in the resolution itself. Um, it says, um, Board of Trustees of the Fort Vancouver Regional Library District authorizes the executive director to negotiate and finalize a right of first refusal limited waiver agreement with the city of Vancouver. My question is just that um, negotiate and finalize. That means that you'll negotiate with them and come back and we get to talk about what's going on. We still vote on this or find what does finalize? Finalize means you're authorizing me to negotiate and sign an agreement, um, not bringing it back to the board for an additional vote. It's um, by giving me that authority, you're allowing me to make that decision on the behalf of the district. 
it was just confusing because you said that you want to negotiate, but here in the last paragraph, it says negotiate and finalize. Yep. So we will not be voting again if we approve this resolution. Correct. I'm, I'm asking you to authorize me to negotiate this waiver. Um, I know the city's timeline won't meet us having a second opportunity unless we set a special meeting. I'm assuming if your plan goes awry, that you may ask them for the delay and that we could have a special meeting or, or discuss it. Um, absolutely. I I actually, you know, I've had a lot of interactions with the city. I, I find them to be a very, you know, forthright organization. They've been very good to us. And in this particular location, they built that parking lot. They managed that parking lot for us. I'm, I'm not terribly concerned they're going to do wrong by us at this point. But I think the long-term agreement really matters to the district um, that we have something that helps ensure that we will have parking there. Is there a motion to adopt resolution 2023-12 right of first refusal limited waiver as presented? If not, is there further discussion or questions? I'll move that we adopt resolution 2023-12. Is I'll second. Second. Thank you. I move this to a vote. Could we get a roll call vote, please? Marie Coffey. Marie, if you could type your note. Thank you. Penny Love Hensley. Yes. Marianne Duncan Cole. Yes. Olga Hodges. Olga, you may have to type also. Yes. Thank you. Vikram Kantwani. Yes. Megan Dugan. Aye. And Christy Morgan. Aye. Motion to approve resolution 2023-12, right of first refusal limited waiver is adopted unanimously. We move to approve resolution 2023-12, right of first refusal limited waiver as approved. I have a question in the chat. In the chat. Okay, uh, go ahead. From Penny, will the OC be able to reallocate the spaces set aside for the foundation before the move due to the late notice from the foundation? Yes, um, we have reallocated that space. Yes, and I typed in. Were you able to get that? Yes. I haven't gotten the type. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, we'll move on to policy committee personnel handbook second reading discussion. I'm going to ask Lee to walk us through what the policy committee got through at this last meeting. Oh, no. <laughs> would well, you like some help with that? <laughs> yeah, I guess I would. I know we bounced, uh, we, Last week seems so long ago and it's not. Um, the policy committee did meet and go through the entire personnel manual. Um, 
answering questions. I was able to answer questions and work through uh, all the way through chapter 10. Yeah, so I'm um, second reading today. Perhaps we could look to the committee um, for any thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, everyone had a copy of this to look through, so I'm hoping everyone took some time to read over it. Um, we did make it through the whole rest of, as Lee said, the whole rest of the, the handbook. Um, for myself, I did want to come back to um, what we talked about last time on page 32 of our packet, point number nine. Um, the I don't know if I voiced my concern with this well last time. But I do want to bring it up once again, where it says we affirm the inherent dignity and rights of every person. I would be fine to leave that in. I say that we remove the entire rest of the paragraph. Um, this I'm willing to have a very long discussion about this right now because there are several different um, ideas covered in this. I want to make sure that as, as a library, when we add things to our handbooks, these are things that we're asking employees to do. We hold them accountable to this, and if they're not doing it, they have consequences. So when you read this, I want to make sure that we're adding it because we we are going to do those things and not because the ALA does it and that it sounds good. I mean, if you just read the very first part of it, you're asking employee Bob, we work to recognize and dismantle systemic and individual biases. That very first point, how are we going to measure that? What's acceptable? When they're not doing it, what happens? And what does it look like if they're not doing it? The very next part, to confront inequity. So worker Bob has to confront inequity and oppression. If you look in our um, our glossary, some of these are defined, um, but they're <laughs> inequity. It even says in our glossary that everyone has to start with the same things, basically, to have equity. How does Bob make sure that everyone's starting with the same things? If we're not doing this as a library, how are we not doing it? Are we not providing books to people? So looking at this from a library perspective, the next one, to enhance diversity and inclusion, worker Bob, I, I just don't see how this is his job to enhance diversity and inclusion, to advance racial and social justice. Those definitions aren't even in our glossary. If we could talk about what racial and social justice means, can worker Bob do this from a library perspective? I, we're asking these folks to be, you know, um, activists in their work situation um, and our libraries, communities, profession and association through awareness, advocacy, education, collaboration services and allocation of resources and spaces. I mean, these are things that there are social services that do many of these. I just find it strange, you know, that we have this giant, you know, pile of things on worker Bob in, in nine how do you hold him accountable to this? How do you say he's doing it or not doing it? And it just, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. And can we, I just think it's a bad, it's a bad policy. I think we should either delete it altogether or leave the first sentence and stop right there. So I would like to comment on this. So this is the personal manual. This is not the library's policy. This is how it relates to the people working in the library, right? Yes, so, we do have a policy that staff have to adhere to. This is how the staff are expected to behave. Correct. And if they don't behave, if they have a attitude of, you know, inequality and operation, FERL will be sued a lot in the court system that is not allowed anywhere in any organization, right? And all the organizations have these policies that, you know, you can't have biases against people based on race, gender, you know, all those things, which they are part of the law. So having that here, uh, you know, is okay. It does not say anything for or against. Are we, if we want, we can also put the laws which are applicable to these, this paragraph, you know, based on this and this law, we can't, you know, have biases or, you know, and for anybody in general. 
Yes, so that's what the policy covers. And if a staff person doesn't follow policy, they would be disciplined. Um, but this number nine doesn't stop right there. It continues to lump in a bunch of other ideas that aren't even defined in our toolkit. If I may, I'd like to read the first paragraph under professional ethics. The American Library Association provides ethical principles that guide the work of librarians, library staff, and other professionals providing information services and are the basis for the public library services provided to our patrons. FBRL staff should support these ideals in the course of their work. And then there is a link. And what this list of nine items is, and the first eight are currently in our policy, um, is the American Library Association's Code of Professional Ethics. We are asking our staff to support these ideals in the course of their work. Um, I don't know that anyone would ever be held to a specific item within the list. Um, it's more an opportunity to share these ideals as a concept um, of library service and public service. Um, and I just wanted to make that clarification because I think I feel like we've gotten a little into the weeds of we're going to hold every employee to these nine specific items on this list. And it's more a list of professional ethics. Um, that we hold as ideas. So you kind of pick and choose what they have to follow on here. I mean, can you define social justice for me, please? I think it's up to the individual to decide what social justice means to them um, because what you might consider social justice is, could be significantly different than what I might. And I think that's true for everyone. In general, I think the idea behind social justice is that we are paying attention um, to those who are marginalized and making sure that um, because they're marginalized, we're aware that we might have to, as Kelsey was describing earlier, we might have to go out of our way um, to find you know, ways to reach them. In many cases, we do that through partnerships um, because that's the, you know, the easiest way we're able to reach those groups. If something can be defined differently by anyone who reads it, does that mean that it's good policy that should be written into a handbook for employees to follow? If one person could define it one way, one person could define it another way, who's to say who's right, who's following it, and who's not? Same with racial justice. Could you define that and say, you know, what exactly is the right way to think and not think? I, I just think this nine is a big pile of things that came from the ALA that feels nice to say to some people, but I just, I don't think it's good pol It's good policy. I have two comments from each. Go ahead. Okay. From Olga, how many of these ideals do we already have covered and captured? Is this redundant? And from Marie, if this is up to the individual, then I would agree with Christy that we should stop at the first sentence as we've given the connection to ALA for those who desire to pursue that. And I would say that we have um, ascribed to ALA's professional ethics to use in our handbook. If we're, they're not really open to editing. I think if we're not going to use them, we don't use them or we include them in totality. So we can't write our own we could choose to write our own. Are you saying like one through nine all together? Yeah, we just because it's ALA thing? standards. We would need to write our own um, our own code of ethics. Why wouldn't we just remove the link saying this is where we took it from and just make it what we what we need? I mean, we get get it from somewhere, right? I well, don't I don't would, understand. I'm sorry. We would need to edit it and call yeah. it our own. Okay. If we're uh, leaving it the way it is in here and and editing it, we need to we need to make it clear that it's a code of ethics that we've developed as an organization, rather than pointing to ALAs. Oh, I see. Thank you. Uh, from Marie, then why are we adding these statements now? These statements have been part of the handbook. 
Um, it, prior to 2017, when we updated it, it's been in the handbook for quite a long time. And as the code of professional code of ethics changes, we've changed it to include the new language. From Shouldn't Olga, we... I prefer we err on the side of vagueness and not in specific definitions that can be relatively interpreted. It just gets too sticky that way. Also, if we're going to include them, do we need to define them in the toolkit? Because it's not really defined anywhere. And like you're saying, it can be interpreted different ways. We would point staff back to ALA. We're saying that we are asking that they support these ideals in the course of their work. So we would be looking back to the ALA standards. Some of these are controversial ideas that not everyone agrees with. So are you saying that people have to think the same way to be able to work for FERL? Pardon me, I didn't get the first part. Some of these are kind of controversial ideas mm -hmm. and not everyone even agrees on the definition. Not everyone holds the same beliefs in them. Um, would you say then that everyone who works for FBRL has to think the same way about these things? No, we're, we're setting this as a standard that we're asking staff to support. So they have to support it. Their actions have to support it. Okay. Uh, from Olga, I'm uncomfortable with how politicized the language is. I guess I would see comment from board members who are not spoken yet. Um, I think I commented last month and I don't know that I have anything new to say. I agree with um, Lee's explanation that this is the American Library Association Code of Professional Ethics. So we shouldn't edit it. We should either adopt it in full or take it out and rewrite professional ethics uh, for FBRL that's specific. I think I would concur with that. Uh, from Olga, I think it's safe to assume we expect professional conduct and mutual respect by and for all staff. Is there a way that we can also just add excerpted from and with the website and, and leave number nine out? So if they want to find more I mean, that would be a way to kind of take some of that language out because I know it can be a real hot issue. But having a hot issue does not mean we should exclude something, right? We can debate about it. If you know we don't want to follow any code of ethics, then we can say that, but these are related to the you know people working in FVRL and if the director and the you know HR is recommending that we follow that as it is being followed by most of the institutes and it's very common, then we can as a board, you know, take their advice into consideration. I, I have a comment in the chat uh, from Marie. I like that idea to craft something unique to our FBRL staff. I don't think anyone is saying that we don't need a code of ethics. Um, and I do think we're taking under advisement the comments. That's why one through eight are, you know, they're fine. And so I think that it would be great to write our own specific to our community's individual needs. And who d defines that, the board or the employees? Well, I'm hoping that we can get some good input from you all and with definitions, you know, instead of things that can be interpreted differently from everyone. And also who defines which communities are we talking about? Is it like, you know, specific sec sects of our community are, you know, all the counties included? Yeah, that's a good point. I meant to say our district as a whole. So will this, happen how? I think we're going to have to get some volunteers who seem to be very invested in this concern 
um, to get together and hopefully there'll be diversity there. Um, I, I'm not sure what people are, are opposed to or uncomfortable with. So I'm, I don't want to volunteer on number nine because I'm comfortable with that. And, and a quick question from uh, Lee or Emilia. So ALA is one organization. Is there any other similar organization? No, um, I've been a member of the American Library Association for 27 years, um, and we are an institutional member as an organization. Isn't uh, there a Washington Library Association also? There is. And do we're, they also follow same code of ethics or they are different? I could check. Um, my assumption is that yes, they probably do follow the same code of ethics. I, yeah, think, ALA, can... I think ALA is a standard to which many organizations point to when they develop their code of ethics. We could certainly do some research. If we wanted to take this out of the personnel manual, we could certainly make a policy or um, some guideline standards. And we could ask employees to pull those together and bring them back. Could we just ask the employees if they have any uh, feelings about number nine that's raised such a concern? Did your, your committee work with the whole policy, didn't they? No, they did not specifically say LA is in or out. What we did was updated the, the handbook for the things that were already in it. And then we did have some committees work on certain parts, but not this one. Uh, from Olga, what consequences do we face if we do not copy and paste their recommended code of ethics? There, no consequences. We would simply not um, call it the ALA code of ethics because it wouldn't be. And we would need to develop our own. Has the legal staff reviewed this um, yet? They did do a review of it with this information in it. From Marie, what codes did we state before this was added? What, what did we state? Our current personnel manual has the same professional ethics Correct. In it, the only addition is number nine because it, it is new to the code of ethics since we last updated the manual. He scares me. <laughs> uh, from Olga, I have no doubt we can go above and beyond these recommendations. Our staff is excellent and have a reputation of mutual respect. So Lee, if I can clarify, I'm hearing you correctly. You're suggesting we pull this out of this policy um, so, so we don't hold up the approval of this policy. Okay. Well, we'll have employees that feel very strongly about keeping it in. I think if we pull it out and say that we're going to develop our own code of ethics, then we can use that in a policy or a, a standalone document. But we could certainly put some language in here about we expect people to, you know, behave professionally. And is that uh, the direction from the board? Kind of. Waiting to hear if anyone else online has anything. It's not just up to the three of us sitting here. I would just support putting in the ALA code of ethics. I also support using the ALA professional ethics. I'm there too. I don't know if Marie and Olga are talking. I obviously support writing our own. And in that, I mean, we keep one through eight and remove nine. Uh, 
I have moments from the chat. Okay, uh, Olga says, I like what Lee has suggested. I support a modification. Marie says, I support her crafting the words towards less politicized and neutral language. I would go with Lee's suggestion also. So to wrap up this discussion and for future um, steps, then would that be pulling this back to policy committee or? I'm not sure what next steps are. It's not just up to me. I need some direction on whether it's policy or guidelines. I think if it's guidelines, that makes it easier. Um, I, I guess my understanding of the entire process was that the personal handbook wasn't a policy. It's we're reviewing it, but it's not a policy. Is that correct? Correct. So you're asking for our input and using us in policy committee to review this, but it doesn't matter what we say or think. I, I, I beg to differ. I actually think the board does approve the personnel handbook. Yeah. Um, it, it is a it, it is a set of guidelines that we hold employees to as in, as as we do a policy. I think we need to know whether the board should even be doing this or not before we can decide. I mean, I'm hearing kind of both ways. This has always been a board approved. It's document. it's a board approved document. We use it when we um, discipline employees. My understanding is if the board doesn't approve the personnel handbook, we don't have a personnel handbook. So you use it to discipline employees by these. So I, I mean, so the next steps. Okay, so next steps. Then. Um, uh, let me interrupt you, Christy. We would not, we're asking staff to support these ideals. We would not discipline them if they're not you know, demonstrating this, if their actions violated its policies or some other portions of the personnel manual, but we wouldn't be disciplining an employee based specifically on this, this part of the. So the what is the next step then? It, like, I thought maybe we bring it back to policy, but then someone said, is it policy? So I don't know where to go next, I guess. So I would say that we would edit this, take this out, and then develop a set of guidelines or a standalone policy. We have the equity policy, right? That covers Correct. names. So mm -hmm. that's done. So there's not a lot of extra work, right? We just have to go through and fix one through nine or whatever then would mm -hmm. be the next thing. Okay. Uh, from Olga, do you want us to vote on it? I think tonight's just discussion. Um, or are you asking to vote on next steps? I... So a quick question for Amelia and Lee. So this is how the organization will be working under you, right? So isn't this document more like, a, you know, okay, here is a document that's good to know for the board versus how the organization will be run by you and Lee? It's, it's really so employees we have clear expectations of what we expect um, and what they can expect working here. So it it, it covers a lot of ground, you know, it covers mm -hmm. um, evaluation, discipline, dress code. Um, so it's, you know, it's a lot of things all piled into one. It's sort of the nature of an employee handbook. Yeah, I don't but wanna... again, this is more how you run the organization being the director, right? Uh, we are not micromanaging how you should run the organization or how HR will implement the rules and regulations and you know local laws. Correct. Right. So this is more for the board to, you know, good to know kind of document. If it's if just they... good to know, why are we spending time in policy committee and asking us to discuss this? I mean. Yes, we're not micromanaging by having one one thing that we disagree with. There's how many pages of this handbook that have no trouble whatsoever. Um, we're spending valuable board time in policies. So I I don't think we just rubber stamp things that come across our desk. Can we um, ask each of the members of the board to um, provide you an explanation of why they're supporting it or not supporting it and, and then see if the policy committee um, has any um, response to that 
before I come to the next board meeting to look at this again. And, and I'm, not, I'm not clear why people aren't supporting it, so. So if, uh, you know, as I informally had heard four members of the board currently support the, including the ALA policy. So even if you want to put it on vote, that's fine, right? And let's move on. You know, let's let let the democracy speak for itself. Uh, from Olga, I encourage you all to look closely at number five and see that it covers this concern in non-political language. And then she's asked me to read number five out loud. Uh, we treat coworkers and other colleagues with respect, fairness, and good faith and advocate conditions of employment that safeguard the rights and welfare of all employees of our institutions. So what, what is political about it? It's a fair statement and fair, you know. Vikram, what Olga was saying was not that that wasn't a fair statement, but that covered, she felt number five covered the same information as number nine. Okay. And I would disagree with that. Number five is relating to coworkers and colleagues. And I don't think number nine um, specifies coworkers and colleagues. It's every person, including patrons, members of the public, and, and it would also include colleagues and coworkers. Um, but I, I just wanna go back to this discussion about whether this is a handbook or a policy. Um, if it's a policy, I think we should change the name of it to personnel policy so that the board can discuss it and have a clear understanding of what we're talking about. I think that's a fair statement. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I think it's pretty frustrating um, working on something and then being told, oh, you don't really have much invested in it. So if it's a policy, we know. And if it's not, then we shouldn't even be spending time on this. Some organizations choose to put, uh, choose to not have a personnel manual. What they have is policies that specifically outline all the things, not all the things, but many of the things that we have in here. So that brings us back to next steps. What I heard was three board members in support of keeping the ALA professional ethics um, statement in this policy and for asking us to modify it. I think four did say they wanted to keep it. Myself, uh, Penny, Marianne, and Megan, as I heard correctly. I heard Penny, Penny say. Can you she... clarify your position, please? I was uh, with leaving it out or writing our own. I liked Lee's approach so we could take it out and work on it uh, and create our own. From Mary, have we clarified if it's our job to review this? I think the answer is yes, but I'm looking at Lee because I'm. Lee. I, I don't have a really good answer for you. Um, one of the, I was tasked with revising the personnel handbook when I started. And so in 2017, we took it to the board for review and then it goes out to the unions to, know, to bargain the impacts of any changes that we've made. Um, I've always been told that the board needed to approve the personnel manual before we used it. So I don't have the background. I can't share with you the background of the why. I do recall when this first came up, however long ago, this question came up and we just kind of went with that. And since we've invested a lot of time in this, mm -hmm. um, we just carry on right now. And if we need to redefine that, where, you know, after this board has their hands off or after this, it, like Megan said, it becomes a policy. Um, we need to finish this path right now and then figure out going forward so we don't run into this again. Mm -hmm. um, so then <laughs> does this come back to policy committee? You're on policy committee with me, Megan. What do you think? 
<laughs> we have to figure out where it goes next. I I would like to um, sort of, I guess, advance what Marianne said earlier. I would like to hear from the rest of the board, uh, members that are not on policy committee, what they would like us to do with this, because we have not gotten any comments from any other members of the board. Um, and policy committee has looked at this several times and brought it forward to this um, body several times. So next steps then, um, please board email. Um, it would be Amelia. With your concerns, suggestions, anything about this, the next policy committee meeting is the third. Amelia will update us when the next policy yeah, committee meeting it's, is it's a Thursday. Up, and uh, have your suggestions to her by then. I think as policy committee, that's a logical place to take a look at it again next time. We can change it going forward. And um, I'd be happy to hear more discussion on this or questions if there is any. Otherwise, those are next steps and we can move on to foundation policy. So any other questions or discussion? Nothing uh, from, from my side. Thank you. Go ahead. Be, uh, go no, ahead. nothing from my side. Thank you. Okay, no. go ahead with the um, online thing. Uh, from Olga, for consideration, we can add patrons to number five and have all bases covered and whomever Megan identified as being left out outside of coworkers. Yeah, Olga, that's a good um, comment. Can you please write an email with that to Amelia, like we said, and then we'll review that at the next policy committee meeting. Anything further? Do we still have an issue of whether this is a policy or just that is still an issue. We do need to finish that work out too, but I think before this is done. <laughs> okay. Has um, legal reviewed this in? Yes. Could we ask that legal would be better served as a policy or as a handbook? Certainly we could, we could do some research. Um, if you're going to do research, uh, yeah. and it was last updated in 2017, I would just like to know if the board reviewed and approved it in 2017. Actually, in 2018, it was approved. And Lee, one more question on this. So if, you know, whether it's a policy or a handbook, however it is, if it becomes a policy, can it be, you know, used are approved by the unions in its as is form because it has been approved by the board. I'm not sure I understand the question. What I think you're asking was, would policy be approved by the, if it was a policy, would it be approved by the board? And yes, we would have to make, we would have to rewrite this as several different policies. No, I, my question is, if we if the board approves this as a policy, what in whatever shape or form, will the unions accept it as is because it has been approved by the board, or they can reject it and we go back? You have a right to set policy. They have a right to bargain the impacts. So we would then bargain you know, kind of the impacts of whatever differences. An example would be attire. We have changed the attire um, section in here. I'm sure that they will, they will want to bargain the impacts of that, some of those changes. And I'm sure they'll have some suggestions for us. They always do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anything else in chat? Okay, um, we'll move on to foundation policy discussion. Thank you. Um, so there was a suggestion that um, some of the language from the MOU, um, this came from the MOU committee um, for the foundation uh, could be put into policy um, to help create some clarity around the parts that FBRL um, cares most about. Um, and I think for the intent from the MOU committee was to provide some clarity um, for some areas that it felt um, were easy, um, easy enough to define uh, for FBRL. Um, so this is a draft policy. This is not a first reading. This is the first time, because it's brand new, anyone is um, having an opportunity to see it and comment on it. Um, 
the black is what uh, Penny provided to me and the red is some editing I did to it. So that's not a, um, there's not been a, uh, a review of it yet. That was just me um, doing a little cleanup. Um, and the, the one highlighted section um, just before administration was something that Vikram asked me to add to it. Um, so I would look to the MOU committee members um, if you have any, when you'd like to say about um, kind of the desire to have a foundation policy. I think uh, to have the policy is going to finally be able to move forward because really at this point, uh, the foundation uh, committee and from or the MOU uh, committee from both the library and the foundation, we've really not been able to make a whole lot of progress on things. And I, I think that to avoid dragging this out even more, because this has been going on for about a year. So I would like to see the policy instead of, you know, we can you know, go back and negotiate with them. I would like them to see what we're proposing. And Penny did share with uh, me over the weekend, um, a new version of the MOU that came to us from the foundation, um, I believe on Friday or Saturday. So it's not a part of your board packet, um, but I can say that um, I did have Rhonda uh, combine it with the last version that we had from December and a, a number of the items that we had in the um, last version of the MOU were, are simply deleted. Oh, <laughs> there is no indication um, that um, those were carried forward at all into the new version. It appears the foundation has just written um, a new version without taking into consideration our requests. I, I think section two was the part that we had the most problems with. Um, because of this move and they're talking about that we're responsible for the office storage space utilities and computer equipment. Um, since they've gone off on, on their own, it basically and kind of said thank you, but no thanks. Uh, I don't think that's applicable anymore. And I know that we talked about um, having separate agreements with uh, IT services and with graphics because they felt that those were two big issues that we're not going to be able to um, go into our MOU that they would make it a separate agreement so that we could you know, work better together. But I, I don't know if we're gonna be able to have um, Rick and Amelia in our next meeting. It has been pushed out from the 18th when we were supposed to meet and we'll be um, now meeting June 3rd. So there's not a lot of forward progress at this point. I have a comment from Marie, which is commenting on not this last comment of Penny's, but the comment before. Yes, I like that idea, Penny. When will we have a, will we have an opportunity to see the new MOU proposal? Soon? Okay. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to share it with you tomorrow. It's, I wanted Rhonda to be able to give us a document that compared both so you could see what was deleted. Yeah, thank you, because I am on the MOU committee and I received that new version also and it did not reflect our last meeting. Which I, also, I our, our next meeting is actually on June 8th. Is it June 8th? Okay. I hope so, because the third is a Saturday and I'm in New Orleans. Oh, thank day. heavens. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you are correct on that, Megan. So where are we right now? Nowhere. I, I think, yeah, I, <laughs> I think what I'd ask for the board to do is to wait. Uh, hopefully tomorrow, Rhonda and I'll be able to send out that version for you so you can see both our last version and what the foundation provided to us um, and kind of do a comparison um, and then think of it in the context of you know how much of that you'd want to codify in policy. Is, is this policy something we want 
specific for library foundation only, or is this something we would want to make more general as library and foundation or whoever we would partner with in the future, like library thunder, or is it specific to foundation? Is that how you guys see this going? I mean, we could change it to fundraiser slash, you know, foundation, because we are wanting to be able to have the ability to contact other organizations to help us, you know, on grants and that we would uh, be participating in. So, you know, it could be done, but it also, the title could be changed if we needed to make that ar arrangement. And we currently have two other policies that apply to the foundation. Um, one is a gift of art and one is, I think our naming conventions policy. From Marie, but then there will be another month before the foundation receives this memorandum. You mean the policy or the, or the memorandum? I, I don't know, think any of us have any idea how soon. Um, Marie, we just we just got a copy of it on Friday. So from the right. foundation staff that took notes at our last meeting. So we can't really control the timeline um, in terms of waiting another month. Uh, that's when our next meeting is. And Penny, I would also suggest that if we can share with the with the foundation team, the other libraries, how they are operating their MOUs, like for example, the Denver library, uh, the Seattle library who have, you know, are in a similar situation that we are and what the expectations are, you know, in general with the foundations, that would be really helpful also for the foundation teams to know. Vic, I can do that. Okay. That would be helpful. Thank you. Anything else in the chat box? No. And any other discussion or questions around foundation policy? All right, moving on to new business, media communications with tech group. Is your, is his microphone on? I'm sorry. No, hey, um, I promise not to read all of the words on these pages. Um, uh, this is uh, an opportunity for us to just have a little discussion about how we handle media requests. Um, the memo on pages 84 and 85 in your board book has the full uh, report on this. Uh, in the gray box, I do include the relative, uh, the relevant information in our bylaws. Um, section 410 uh, talks about how the board shall speak as a as a, as a body, um, and that no one should speak or act on behalf of the board without prior authorization. Um, section 5.2 gives the executive director uh, the authority to be the representative to the communities and the general public. Um, however, um, I want to sort of talk first real briefly about what we've been doing in the past, historically and currently, um, and then um, we realize that there may be some gray here in the bylaws and maybe an opportunity to either change our protocols or at least look at the protocols or the bylaws and see if that we need to do an update. So um, 
again, not going to read all of the, these, but um, traditionally there are um, three different types of stories that come out about the library. Um, and I will say that this first bucket is 98, 94. Five percent of all the stories in the last uh, three years, uh, last four years, we average about forty stories about the library um, in a year. Only one is usually involve a, uh, someone asking to talk to a board member. Um, so these are stories that um, are about uh, district programs or library programs, etc. Generally speaking, then um, the executive director or their designees are the people who talk to the media about that. That might be Amelia, that might be myself, uh, a member of admin team, or um, the actual branch people. Um, I'm looking at Ruth and David and Elizabeth, who I've all <laughs> thrown at the media um, recently enough. Um, the final one, the next, the second one is um, board policies or decisions. So things we've been talking about today. Um, generally speaking. Um, a member of the media will either ask for um, to talk to a member of the board specifically, um, or um, if they want to talk to someone, uh, generally speaking, we have in the past uh, routed their questions to the board chair. Um, there is a third bucket, which is that um, there are often stories that are about the foundation or the friends of the libraries, and we connect them up to the foundation accepting that of course there are variations of all three of these where we might have a building project that would have a quote from the foundation a quote from the local board member and a quote from amelia or the branch manager so if we switch to the second page the second page um so really um again just keeping in mind these um bylaws that are off off to the your right uh in the gray box um the discussion really comes about is um, how do these bylaws um, get interpreted interpreted when uh, it comes to the communications? Are there any concerns about the way we have been handling this historically? Um, should the bylaws identify a specific trustee or spokesperson? Um, is there a recommendation for different processes uh, for when we uh, when a media person speaks to us? And then finally, um, quite often, most of the, most of the time, the the newspapers are working on a on a, a bit of a timeline. Um, so part of the concern is um, if they need to have a have a quote from somebody in within a day or two, um, how do we change those? Um, uh, protocols uh, when we have maybe more time or less time. So really just want to leave this up for you to discuss and I uh, can answer questions. I so, don't have, oh, go ahead, please. It's a quick question. So on, on the previous page, right, you mentioned like the, you know, if anybody is contacted for the feel good stories, if somebody mm -hmm. you know wants to talk to a particular member, say for example, somebody wants to talk to Megan as she is a representative for the city of Vancouver, right? Yes. So those kind of uh, requests will go to that person only. They will not go to or should they go to the chair for approval? Maybe. Yeah, that's the question that we're asking. You know, the two. There's sort of a, a a combination of the last bullet and the first section and the first bullet of the first. So, um, uh, if we were to do yes, uh, when Ridgefield did their when we did the build the building campaign, um, we designated the board uh, member from the Ridge the community of Ridgefield and North Clark uh, at large um, as sort of the the primary uh, spokesperson. Um, don't know if I did that or if the media asked us for that, or we also talked about it um, with the board chair. Right. Um, so if any request is coming for a particular person, right, if who are representing that particular area, then that person will can speak on individual basis, right? Like if say, you know, somebody wants to talk about Golden Dale area, like Olga would be the right person to talk if they want to, you know, know her views or they want, you know, some specific things to talk about, right? If somebody wants to talk about Vancouver, they can, you know, talk to some specific person who is appointed for that particular area. But if it is like a general, right, what the example you gave for, say, a new building, or Richfield Library, then yes, that can come to a 
chair or you know somebody can be designated for that particular specific thing yes that that's how we have been doing it so the question you know is 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 that a, is that do we want to maintain that process and or do we need to um adjust the bylaws to sort of say that um, and I think that maybe there was a question online. Uh, there's a question from Olga Tack. When a member, sorry, multiple questions now. Tack, when a member of the media asks to speak to a specific board member, what is a reasonable expectation of that board member being notified and consenting to one, being spoken for, two, having a chance to respond? Also, what is the expectation? and standard of a board member notifying you or Amelia that they have been asked to make comment. Personally, I've reached out directly to Amelia, but can we set up a reasonable expectation? Okay, let me parse those into a couple of different answers. So the question about when a, a media person's asked me or Amelia to talk to a board member, um, the timeline and expectations would be that um, I would uh, probably email the board member. I would get the contact information for the reporter. I would email the uh, board member and let them know that a reporter is interested in talking to them. Um, I would try to give them a sense of the timeline. Usually when a reporter asks me, I try to say, you know, what's your deadline on this um, to give a sense of the timeline. Um, I think that um, it's also always fair um, to refuse to comment is usually a uh, a negative in the journalism world, but that is that is always a possibility too. If you do not want to um, comment, or if you've not been able to be reached, um, that's that's a possibility. Um, it's also a possibility if you have been asked to comment to pass that on to. Um, if we were to create a mechanism where there was a board chair, you know, responding or a different way of doing a a, a response, we could consider um, consider that. The second question was. Also, what is the expectation and standard of a board member notifying you or Amelia that they have been asked to make comment? Personally, I've reached out directly to Amelia, but can we set up a reasonable expectation? Yeah, I think that that's probably the reasonable expectation. It would be useful for us to know, um, partially so that we can be tracking that, and then we make sure that we uh, include those um, in the board clips each month. Um, I think that's fair to just send that to Amelia and or um, you know, CC, you can CC me as well, um, but it probably needs to uh, go to Amelia. I do have a question about timing. Um, you said that oftentimes there are tight timelines yeah. for their stories. Um, would it be possible? I know we have a lot of rural people and ideally we're all checking our email every day, but it's not always possible. Um, is it possible in an urgent situation such as this, that the trustee could also receive a text of some sort, or I don't know if that's possible, but I would hate for an opportunity to be missed for for a comment that's requested. Yeah, I think um, possibly um, not that we need to go back to the next uh, that next slide, but um, possibly what we might want to do is that that number five um, uh, give leave it up to uh, executive director and my discretion to determine whether we would want to text or call. Um, how we would contact the board member. So like, again, if if the newspaper's like, I need a quote in the next five minutes, we're probably going to want to make a phone call. <laughs> yeah. So we could count on that happening. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. From Olga, is it safe to say you will reach out to a board member within a business day that someone is interested in talking to them? Um, I, I, again, that's the time question. Um, I do think that we have had uh, times where a newspaper um, have have said, um, you know, I'm planning on putting this out on Friday. It's Tuesday now, so let me know within the next day or two. Um, but we've also had time where if it's something's more of a news story, um, they might want to put it out that day. Um, I'm thinking specifically about the flood, um, where I was talking to newspapers or and uh, TV TV <laughs> throughout the day all for for weeks. Um, yeah, sorry, my phone's going off. Uh, 
I am asking this from Olga. I'm asking specifically not about the media's timeline, but our own operational timeline. I, I think what I'd like to say about that, Olga, is in the instance that I think you're referring to, I was on vacation. Um, I was not even in the country, so I was in a different time zone. Um, so communication was more difficult. And I think um, the expectations that the board has for, um, you know, the executive director, the communications director, in terms of timely response. I know I found out about um, newspaper, I think on a Thursday, but you know, I, there's always going to be variables. We can set hard and fast rules and say, we'll always do it this way. But sometimes depending on who the newspaper decides to contact first, um, whether or not that gets, you know, seen by someone who might, you know, be out for whatever reason, um, you know, we're going to do our best, but I don't know that we'll always be able to say, yes, we'll contact you within this many hours. I was given a few seconds for a chat to come through if there is one. Otherwise, we can move on to public comments at board meeting discussion. Um, I wanted to give some information. At the last meeting, we talked about um, there was a request to split public comments into two 30-minute increments. The first being, um, one of them being general public comment. You could speak on any topic. And the other being agenda item only related comments, um, adding up to a total of an hour. So the same amount of time we have now. Um, one would go in the beginning of the meeting, the other 30 minute session. So the beginning of the meeting would be the agenda items. And then the end of the meeting would be the um, open comments. So for anyone else who wanted to comment, um, I, I wanted to hear the rest of the board, what they thought about that. And then the second thing I wanted to talk about was at the end of public comments, I've been frequently for I think the last three or four meetings, we haven't filled our hours. So I would ask, you know, is there anyone else who would like to comment at that time? Um, I've heard that people would rather I did not do that. So I wanted to open discussion both about splitting the public comment time into two parts and also allowing people who have not signed up to comment at the end of, of comments. And Chair, if I could just make a point of clarification, there is no requirement for length of time on public comments. It's as long as you want it to be, so. Yeah. And also we were gen generally suggesting that the open public comments be at the start of the meeting Right, because we know no most of the people don't like to sit on for like three hours to comment. So the open items, you know, general public comments can be in the front of the meeting and all the agenda related can be at the end of the meeting. Um, Vic, I think I would do that opposite because if someone's commenting about something on the agenda that night, I would want to hear about it before we discussed and decided on it. So I would want to hear the relevant to the agenda comments at the top of the meeting. Okay, sounds good. Okay, uh, for Marie, I would suggest not asking and who decides what is open public comments and what isn't. And from Olga, I think we should keep public comments all at the start, given how late our meetings tend to go. go ahead. Well, I don't want to speak for Christy, but I, um, I think. Uh, I like that she's been asking if there's any other comments, especially when we have a lot of time left. Um, I think it's more equitable to offer that to people that maybe didn't know what they wanted to say before they heard what someone else said, or they worked up the courage to speak um, while they were listening, or maybe they arrived late. And so I would want to have that continue. I was just gonna clarify that um, the question was about who decides what's open and what what's not, is that um, agenda items would the first comment period, I'm sorry, one of the comment periods would be restricted to agenda items only. 
And then the other comment period would just be whatever you wanted to talk about your fishing trip or policy or whatever. Um, so my, I feel that we should leave it as it is, um, but I didn't want to make that decision without hearing from everyone else also. So when they fill up the form, they, that should be related to one of the agenda items, right? And if it's general comment, they, that can be anything. Yeah, I think that's something we would definitely work out if we split the public comments. Um, but first we have to decide if that's something we want to do or if we want to just leave it all together at an hour in one session. I think if we split the uh, comments, it's going to be very, it's going to be almost prohibitive for some people to sit around for three hours waiting at the end to make their comments on general things. I would agree with Megan that the first part we could ask the first questions to be things that are on the agenda. If there are none, then we would move on to the other issues. I have a comment from the chat from Marie. I'm okay with it as it is. Megan makes good suggestions to justify asking. I do have a problem um, because a public comp, when you're doing any kind of changes in your um, legal structure, um, adoption of certain policies, we should have the public comment attached to that item. Um, and so I'm not quite, I'm not, comfortable with. Um, Marianne, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and all of our statutory requirements for public hearings associated with levy and budget would stand, that, that they would be separate from this. Thank you. That's where I was headed. So I guess um, what I'm seeking tonight is just to not an official vote. It's not an action item, but I just wanted to take everyone's opinion into consideration. So first of all, um, I would ask you guys, give me feedback each if you want to leave comments as they are or split into two parts, please. So should we just email Amelia about the same? Or do you want to? We could just do it right now. This is not official. If you could just tell me now so I know what to prepare for next meeting. I, I'll go first. I would like to leave everything as it is. I, I would leave it as it is. Yeah, I want to keep it the same also. I would like to split it if possible, if everybody else agrees. Both Marie and Olga said leave as is. I have no problem with that. I think sometimes when somebody's coming in, they have an issue that they just want us to be aware of. And I, it's the library handles a lot of different issues. And sometimes during the course of a meeting, people become, come to realize, uh-oh, we've got an, this isn't what I thought. This isn't what I expected the library can do, what, what the library can do. And so offering that comment period at the end, you may want to restrict it to time well, yeah, if I think we'll leave it as it is for now. Um, it sounds like there are, are the majority in favor of that. My next request would be we do do the same thing really quick on if you like having um, me ask if there are people who would like to comment that have not signed up at the end, please. Um, I would say yes, I would like to ask people if they would like to comment. I already spoke on that, and I think you should keep asking. That's okay. I have a comment from Olga. I agree. Let's ask one last time in case folks have lingered and want to make comment. Thank you. <laughs> I have a comment from Marie. Okay. Great. All right, moving on. Executive Director Search with Lee, please. Thank you. 
the personnel committee has met two times, maybe three. And uh, we've uh, interviewed, we did a request, uh, reached out to consultants, received several proposals, interviewed two. We are in the process of finalizing a contract with a firm to conduct our search for us. I anticipate we'll have that um, signed off by tomorrow. We'll then move forward into developing a, um, the first part will be developing a brochure and the recruitment materials with them. They'll do a recruitment, then we'll do virtual interviews and of uh, semi-finalists and then an on-site, probably two to three day event for uh, in-person interviews. I don't anticipate we'll be doing the in-person much before mid to late August, um, which means we'll have a uh, period of time without, after Amelia goes before we get someone on board. At what point do we get to discuss if we want to hire an interim or is that just something we would not do? I don't understand the process around that piece. I think that's totally up to you guys. Um, and I think you can discuss it at any point in time. At the personnel committee, do you think, or at a meeting like this, where would that come up? I would believe that would be executive session. I'm looking to Amelia for some guidance. Okay. That would be executive session and then so discussion. So you would just request that from you at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. You would need to appoint that person officially and develop an employment contract for them. I think we have... Um some fairly skilled people that work with um, Amelia. So I'm placing trust in the staff. The only issue I have is, is, it, is there any signature issues that require the um, director? And so would you just take a look at that? Because we may need to go officially say that person will have the signature authority. Amelia, just, just so you know, um, the current structure is it is the executive director and their designees. So we currently have now with Mary gone, we have three signatories um, that can sign. Yeah. Um, and we could add Ruth um, as a signatory. So that would so we have another one. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. I have a question from Olga. What have we done in the past before Amelia was hired? Did we have an interim? No, we did not. The uh, previous director had agreed to stay until we got someone hired and in place. They worked part-time uh, through the summer and Amelia started in October. So they weren't in the office every day, but they were continued to be executive director until we got Amelia hired. Any other questions? You know where I live. From Marie, Lee, is HR hiring another search recruiting company for management position in VA? Was told that, wondered if true. No, we are doing the branch manager three recruitment for Vancouver ourselves. We have a slate of candidates that we'll be doing virtual interviews for with this week. I'd say. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of moving parts right now. So. From Marie. Okay, glad that rumor is put to rest. Other questions or comments for Lee? Any? Nothing in chat. Okay. Um, with the. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, from Olga, I just want to say Lee is doing an amazing job. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Would the board like to make any final comments? Well, uh, Rick already mentioned, but I had a really great time at the Woodland uh, fundraising event, and uh, Brian and I um, enjoyed the band. It was um, led by the banjo playing of our kids' uh, elementary school principal, so that was fantastic to see him again after all these years. I wanted to thank David for having us. Thank you so much. And the foundation, thank you for highlighting your efforts you put into fundraising. It's really helpful to see the numbers and things like that laid out. Thank you guys. Are there any comments that came through? Great. From Marie. Yes, agree with Olga. Lee is working hard for us. 
<laughs> Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Oh, wait. I have to do the next one, right? Um, the next uh, regular meeting is Tuesday, June 20th, 2023. It will be hybrid and at Goldendale Community Library. It would be great if some of you would be there. <laughs> yeah. I, will be there. I will be there. Will you be there? Are you on the spot? I might be in Las Vegas, oh, but I might be there. <laughs> I make a motion that we adjourn. <laughs> Uh, from Marie, it's, it's uh, time. It's to be there. any objections all right meetings adjourned thank you thank you good everybody. night good night thank you Thank you.